Um, we have very wonderful presenters. Um, we have um, Dr. Rafis Marquez, Gisela Diaz, and Francisco um, Cornejo joining us to present on cultural humility, working with Latin, Latinx youth and families. Um, we will have a part one and a part two of this. The part two will include um, interventions. Um, the beauty of having the presenters today is they work in the field right now. Um, they have done work like we do, and they have lots of very practical applications um, for the field based on their work. Today, what we're going to do is um, have the presenters look at um, generational, historical, contextual information to help us understand the, the, the context of doing these interventions, um, working with um, Latino youth and families. And I will let them um, introduce themselves. Um, without further ado, Dr. Marquez, would you like to begin and introduce your, um, more fully, your presenters? Magnificent. Thank you, Rick. Um, thank you, everybody that came in early, and thank you for being here today and giving us the opportunity to share some of our thoughts about the context of uh, working with the Latino community, or the Latinx community. Um, I'm Dr. Ramfis Marquez. I'm a clinical psychologist and a licensed counselor in the state of Virginia. Um, I'm, I was also licensed for a long time in Washington, D.C., but I let that license lapse at this point because I don't do any work in D.C. at this time. I'm about 50 miles away from D.C., so I decided not to commute anymore. Um, but if Rick wants me to go back to D.C., I'll probably get my license again. Or maybe to Ohio. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of work with intensive in-home. Uh, I've done a lot of similar work to what you guys do in your program right now with what we call in Virginia here, the CR2 teams. Um, I've done a lot of outpatient mental work. I've, I've done a lot of inpatient mental work, mental health work. Um, and I think my, my career started around 1996. Uh, I've lived in uh, different places over the time of my uh, career. Uh, and I had the experience of uh, also traveling to many countries uh, in Latin America and abroad. Uh, I think that the, the context of what we do, uh, we are all specialized or we are students of the context of trauma recovery. And within that context, um, in the way that we're setting up the presentation, I think that we want to give you a, an essence of background and history of uh, the patients, the clients that you guys might be encountering uh, in, in a full context. So the appreciation for the dynamics that you're facing, which in terms of trauma, many of them are things that we have never seen here in the United States, thanks God. Some of them, sadly, we're starting to see right now with the events that are happening all over the country, with these riots and these events of violence that are happening everywhere. Uh, but the majority of events of trauma that our clients from Latin America have experienced are things that we have never seen before. Um, so we wanted to make this presentation and maybe people are not logging in because they saw it was like almost 80 PowerPoints. Um, but that's not, we're not going to go PowerPoint by PowerPoint. We're just going to have a discussion and feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, what we want to do is... Um, bring that essence so then we can contextualize that to the neural effect and emotional effect that this has in our clients and then how to assess uh, for assess in terms of the context of an intake, assess in terms of the context of risk, assess in context of understanding the, tr the effect of trauma in their lives, how to treatment plan and then how to bring the family into, into the mildew of uh, facilitating the care of our clients. Uh, with me today are uh, my co-host Gisela Diaz. Gisela is a school psychologist and I'll let her introduce herself in a moment. And Francisco Cornejo, who's a social worker, uh, recently graduated. He was my intern for almost two years and now he's joining us as a, as a peer and co-worker. Um, so I'll, I'll let them talk a little bit about uh, what their vision is of the training and, and let them introduce themselves. 
Um, I'm Gisela um, Diaz, as Ranfi said, um, I'm a bilingual um, school psychologist in Prince William County, uh, Virginia. This is, um, as uh, Dr. Marquez was saying, about 30, 40 minutes uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, we had um, a pretty diverse community in the communities that we work, and I work mostly um, with uh, students and families from Central America. I also have um, a lot of experience working in the health field and in the um, justice um, department and law enforcement uh, field previously. Uh, so I hope um, to bring um, a perspective of understanding not only um, not only the, how to work with, with these families, but how to uh, bring empathy to your interventions uh, with them. Because what I have found through the years, even when I'm a Spanish speaker, is that um, that humility that of understanding who they are is what makes those connections strong with our families. So I hope to, to talk a little bit about my experiences and um, and give you a lot of examples of things that we we have done um, toward the community in the Washington DC metro area. Francisco. So hi everyone, my name is Francisco. Like Dr. Marquez mentioned, um, I am a social worker, recently graduated, and I worked with Dr. Marquez for two years as his intern working in the community health center, um, giving treatment to many people in the community primarily Spanish speaking and with large amounts of trauma. Before that, I worked in group homes, I've worked in medical settings and community health centers. Um, I've worked with the Salvadorian consulate, um, just looking at different ways to engage with the, the Latinx community. Um, and even above that, as a member of the Latinx community, I've grown up with the community and with the immigrant community, learning their stories, being able to realize how those stories affect me and how that shapes the way that I approach the work that I do with the people I work with. So the for me, the goal is looking at how my lived experience could potentially be useful for you all, as well as looking at how we understand the different things that your clients may be facing. So please, by all means, if any questions come up, feel free to interrupt us, raise your hand in the Zoom, or just unmute yourself and ask us, and we're more than happy to to veer away from the topic of conversation. Okay. Um, can we start moving the PowerPoint forward, Francisco? Um, let me start with the notion of, uh, I, I see that there's uh, maybe five, six, four or five people in the group right now. In the, uh, Can I ask you guys how many of you right now are working with uh, within the Latino community or with Latino patients? Um, I will use the term Latino moving forward. I will not use the term Latinx uh, just because that's uh, more fluid for me to use. And to be quite honest, the context of Latinx is quite new for people of my generation. It's not contextually something that we have ever used. So it's a, it's a, it's a term that the new generation of Latinos like Francisco has embraced fully, but in the context of my age, is something that I'm, I'm a Latino male and my wife is a Latino woman. Um, and that's one of the first uh, contexts of, of discussion. If you go to a parent and tell him, well, you're Latinx, they'll look at you like, uh, I'm not sure what you're calling me, right? <laughs> so, um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, one, how many of you are working with Latinos right now? And two, um, how, what, what is your expectation? What brought you into this training today? Do you have any specific questions that we can consider answering through the process of the training or perhaps right now just to start any type of verification? So I just want to hear your voices and, and let me know that the people that, are, uh, that they have no video right now are still there. I work in Bowling Green, Ohio, and I have not worked with any Latino families in the past year that I've been there that I can remember. Any questions that you're, you're thinking, anything that you wanted to perhaps hear specifically today? Yeah, um, I don't know if this is appropriate for me to ask, but I did run into this in a past. So let, me, let me pause you for a second. Let me pause you for a second. I am a true believer that people learn by asking. Okay. And 
And I don't want anybody to feel here that they have to, if, if you have a question, just ask. Okay. I will never take offense to it unless you call me an ugly name. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that, just to wreck. Uh, <laughs> because she does call me no ugly names as it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was working with a family. I, I did a very intensive program, and I was working with a, a female uh, teenager that was having sex, and I talked to the father about birth control and... I hit a brick wall, like absolutely not. It wasn't a consideration. And here I am worried about this teenage girl and everything she has going on and getting pregnant. And I, I was really stuck because that just wasn't an option. So I didn't know what to do. Yeah. So, so we will go into a whole section today. And I'm glad uh, Hisela, actually, for those of you that did not notice, Hisela is not just hanging out with me. She's my <laughs> wife. So Hisela took notes. Um, and and we're gonna go in a whole section where we're gonna talk about machismo, which is the context of the over beyond the male patriarchal uh, dynamics that happens within the Latino community. There's a context of machismo where men have greater power than females. So we're gonna talk about that, and and we're also gonna talk on the difference between the patriarchal structure versus the machista structure. And I think we're gonna to touch on that. Um, but we, I'm going to make a point to, to discuss what you just asked specifically in a minute. Uh, once we get to that section, he said I took notes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, ladies? And I'm not sure if Callie, Callie is a, I'm not sure if that's a name, a male or a female name. Allison? She is a female. Kaylee? A yes. Female. Oh, it's yep. Kaylee. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I also work in Bowling Green with Christine, um, and I have not um, worked with very many Hispanic families uh, recently. It's not a very diverse population in Bowling Green. Okay. Bowling Green is where with relationship to Ohio? North, uh, south, east, west? Uh, it's like northwest Ohio. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty rural area okay. Okay. in terms of community would you say that there's a small latino community large latino community medium-sized latino community i think it's a small latino community yeah okay, okay. okay. um is it kaylee or kaylee, mm -hmm. kaylee. yeah I'll, I'll screw it up too um and you work in finley ohio right yeah so Finley is right below Bowling Green, or kind of below it, and it's like, they're both like, what, 40 minutes from Toledo, an hour mm -hmm. from Toledo? Mm -hmm. So it's all Northwest, um, and the Northwest is very rural. Mm -hmm. um, they might have, um, you know, the farming community mm -hmm. right. um, might have, uh, a fairly decent sized uh, population of you know Latino uh, workers and etc. But you know it's hard to say. I'm going to look up some statistics while you guys talk. Yeah, and we're going to talk about uh, limitations with access to care and and as we progress in the in the presentation because um, within these communities, it's very interesting. They're very close. Um, and um, unless you work with them, sometimes you don't even know they're there. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so definitely learning more statistics. Uh, it, it could be that they're not even reported in the statistics. So, um, so definitely there are families that you can encounter uh, uh, for referrals, especially as, um, their children start going to school. I think this is um, one one exposure start to happen um, mostly when the kids um, get into the system. Yeah. Is there anybody else that I miss? I don't think so. Right. All right. Laura, how are you? I'm good. Hello. So I'm actually, I work for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, so I don't work directly with clients. I'm just a researcher on the grant that funds our mobile response project. Okay. Um, and I'm also 
uh, work with our um, cultural and linguistic competency uh, aspects of the grant. So I'm just listening in. Great. Um, thank you for being here. Um, uh, Francisco, can you move the PowerPoint as we, uh, we, as we start talking? Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, the whole point of the presentation is for you to grasp the big picture of this. So I will go from the macro concept to the micro concept. Uh, I send the presentation to everybody. If you did not receive it through email, uh, by all means, please uh, ask Rick, Rick for it uh, or email me. Uh, I, I think my email is in the chat also. Uh, and I'll send it to you. Uh, I sent us a PDF format because it was actually big and it would not allow me to send the PowerPoint itself. Um, I, there's a context of language uh, that uh, we have right here in front of us. I'm gonna let Francisco go over that real quick uh, so we can define different terms that we use to within our community. So, with with language and how we define ourselves, so this kind of goes into what Dr. Marquez was talking earlier between Latino, Latina, and Latinx. That those terms kind of shift the way that, or shift between the generations. So you have you may have someone like it says on the side who may identify themselves as Hispanic, whereas that kind of refers more to the Spanish, our Spanish origins um, from Spain. Latino referring more to the Latin American side of it. Latinx is a little bit more of this millennial uh, notion of all inclusivity in terms of not dividing things between genders, which is something that happens very commonly in Spanish. Um, most of our words have either a feminine or a masculine um, ending to it. So Latino being the masculine, Latina being the feminine. Um, Latinx kind of tries to break that down a little bit to make it all inclusive to include people who may be non-binary. Um, or instead of segregating certain certain groups by only saying Latino and not referring to the feminine to the female counterparts in, in that in that population as well, um, when we look at Latin America, it's it's a huge region. It's Central South American and the Car South America and the Caribbean as well. So you have a wide range of different diversity of people and culture. So that's one of those things that we're going to dive into a little bit more. Um, Hispanic Americans, we're looking at people who live, who are born here in the U.S., um, but it can also include every, everyone in all of America, um, all of the Americas. Chicano is another term that is very specific. That's more referring to L.A. culture and, and Mexicans in general. So it would be the Mexican Americans. Um, they may define themselves as Chicanos. So you may see some of that going on. Right. Uh, other two common terms that you might hear, especially if you're working with the Puerto Rican community, is uh, New Yorkans, who are people that are born in New York to Puerto Rican parents. Uh, and then you have the concept of Boricua, which is a Native American, na the Native American name of the Puerto Rican people. Uh, Puerto Rico used to be called in the Native American culture Boricain. So Puerto Ricans that are born in the island call themselves Boricuas. Um, Next. So I think that Francisco already covered a portion of this. Um, and I, I'm just going to emphasize the notion that when you're dealing with, the, with, that, with this specific community, the Latinx community, um, you will find that um, I have a friend who's a linguist uh, in Mexico. And he opened my eyes to the reality of our language. So people think, well, I'm going to learn Spanish. Um, Spanish actually has 17 different dialects within the Spanish language. Uh, so just like English, we have Old Spanish, which is what is uh, spoken in, in Spain for the most part. Um, and then in every single country, uh, you have a manifestation of the, of the language to make it 17 different dialects that are mixed with different words be it influenced by Native American words or be it influenced by African words. Um, in Puerto Rico, for example, we call, we call what we speak usually Spanglish uh, because it, it's, a, it's a language that is mixed between the Taino language, the African language, and the English language and Spanish. Um, it's not, 
it's, we don't see it as a, an integrated language, it's just what we speak. But for example, when I go to lecture at the University of Mexico, the first time that I went, um, all of a sudden I looked to the side and the gentleman that invited me, um, he's talking as I'm talking to the people. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm interpreting for you. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean you're interpreting for me? I'm speaking in Spanish. And he looked at me and he said, no, you're not. So, so the diversity in language, when you start just rolling on it and, and just being fluid on it, uh, people might not understand what you're saying. Or pe or, so even in, in the native language, people might struggle following up with you. He said, I have a couple of different stories on this, but one of the funniest ones that she always tells is the one where this woman came in and started talking to her and she knows she's speaking Spanish and she's trying to take notes because she doesn't realize that what she's saying to her, uh, she fully understands. Um, and there was even a conversation where she used some terminology uh, that we used to refer to a, a boss. And for her, the term, for Gisela, the term was referring to a baby. So here we went into a world of, well, now you're talking about me holding your baby, but you don't have a baby in your hand. And this is a, in the context of mental health. So automatically, if somebody tells you, hold my baby, and they don't have a baby in their hands, what do you think? Right? There's something going on here beyond the conversation. So this is a type of uh, discussion that we want to have with you guys. Um, next. Hey, Ramfis, I, I have a comment yes. or question. So that example for me truly complicates, like, so, you know, we might, we don't have a ton of bilingual staff. And so we might ask for, you know, a translator. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. but, but through your story, what I'm hearing is it's got to be very specific to, um, to the dialect that that, that that family is speaking. Yeah, and which something makes it, makes something it harder. Important, and I think this is why we started the presentation as we move along. Um, we want everybody to understand that understanding not only um, the difference in language, but the difference in, in the culture, the difference even in the experience, in the generational experience, will change um, significantly. Um, uh, from family to family um, and you know when, when that is very true to, to in the United States you know uh, perhaps somebody from Boston speak very different from somebody from Georgia um, the the differences within the Latino community are, are, are pretty significant and um, and I think understanding a little bit of the background uh, will help us um, you know uh, be more accessible to those families because something that that we found working um, uh, with with Latino families is that um, in order for them to open up to you they have to trust you and the only way you will win that trust is um, with respect showing them that respect um, so I always see it like walking together in a journey rather than uh, I'm teaching them um, uh, something specifically um, so, you know, we are a pretty diverse group in terms of language and culture, and, and those are all things that we're going to be touching uh, through the presentation. Uh, and great, in, thanks. So, yeah, and in that same context, for example, I go to court a lot uh, to do expert witness work and things of that nature, and sometimes when, when the, I, I hear the interpreters saying things that I know is not what I have said or what the client has said. Um, so that's sometimes the context, depending on where the interpreter is from, it might get lost. So, and personally in practice, I have, I, whenever I talk to people as I'm doing an intake, um, I actually ask them, do you, are you following me? Do you understand that word? Or if I'm, I know at this point, I know certain words that mean different things in different cultures. And I always go, always ask the person, what does this word mean for you? Uh, so I don't automatically assume that I'm speaking Spanish. I clarify that what I'm saying is an accurate statement. 
the biggest, uh, most horrifying experience, um, and this is uh, something that happened to me in the Dominican Republic. I went to teach uh, self-protection skills in the Dominican Republic for the police uh, and the military in that country. And all of a sudden, I find myself um, in a grocery shopping store, and I asked this woman for to hand me over the bags. And apparently the word that I was using for bags was very negatively in a sexual context. And this woman was ready to kill me. Uh, to me, I was just asking for bags. Uh, and I could not understand what was happening uh, until I commented to one of the gentlemen that is escorting me there. And he looked at me like, what did you, why would you say that to her? I'm like, I'm asking for bags. Uh, so, so even words like simple words that in, in our context mean something might mean something horrific in a translation from one, one culture to the next. To be quite honest, um, I think that when you're, when you're speaking in English, it's usually not as a drastic uh, context of language. Uh, it's easier to communicate when you have a Latino client or a Latinx client that speaks English. They are less likely to understand you. Problem being that many of our parents in particular uh, are unable when they move here to learn the language. That has in itself a context. People many times think, well, they just don't want to learn the context of the language. But he said, I will probably go into this later. Many of our parents um, have not learned the full context of their own natural uh, first language, their Spanish language. And when they, the context of learning different languages relates uh, to the idea of learning your native tongue from childhood to uh, two, three years in maybe more, two, three, four years in development in the context of school. Um, so if you have not gone to school after you have a very basic context of, of language acquisition, which then makes it extremely hard for you to learn a second language. Um, do you want to comment on that? I want you to move to the statistics. So, um, so they can have like a point of reference. Um, so, so when we, when we get, um, more in details about the language acquisition and the history, I will also explain, um, a lot of things that at least for me didn't make any sense. Um, but when you understand the history of the, of the, of of all the diverse groups, you will have a better perspective. Um, and the reason we want to make sure that um, you all have all this data is because although you are not uh, working with um, with with a lot of uh, Latinos at this point, um, the Latin American community is the fastest growing community within the United States. Um, so it is estimated that by uh, 2000. To, to, 2050, we will be the majority, um, um, the, ma the major uh, minority community. The largest, so, the largest, the largest. Minority. So, so you will definitely, uh, in your career, uh, unless you play the lottery and win, uh, we probably will uh, will be working uh, with with one of these groups. Something very interesting it, it, it is is just how fast it happened because. You know, where we are um, located, when I first moved here, I was the only bilingual psychologist for the whole county. And now um, I would say the county really had changed demographically in the last 10 years. So, um, so th this ch these changes usually um, happen uh, pretty quick. Uh, we know, right. um, as we talk about... Yeah, we were very rural. Mm -hmm. When we moved here, it was like the majority of uh, the, our community was composed of farms. It was a farming, large farming community. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we are apparently, for what I read uh, recently, we're one of the most growing uh, areas in Virginia. And I think we're fifth in the country in terms of uh, young couples moving to the area to establish families. Well, and regardless of, of that, something that you see also with the immigration is that um, although most immigrants um, move to larger communities um, and cities like New York, Chicago, um, uh, Los Angeles, you will also see changes based on political uh, situations and, you know, 
we will not uh, get a lot into politics um, in here, but there is a lot of issues concerning um, immigration right now that made these communities kind of um, dispersed into different areas. So we want to provide with the present with this presentation and the statistics, we definitely want to uh, provide you with some background. A lot of um, a lot of the things are going to be in the presentation as we want to talk more about um, the examples. Um, but definitely, it is very important um, for us for you to have that background when you're working uh, with families. So when, going going back, we know um, Mexican Americans are the largest Latino population um, in the United States. This is definitely um, uh, the families that you will probably will. Um, will encounter the most. In um, our experience, we have a lot more experience working with Central America just because it's the, the population um, in this Washington DC area and also have a very uh, big political connotations of why they're here. Um, and as you um, go to, uh, to New York City, now Florida, um, uh, you also will be significantly exposed to uh, Puerto Ricans. We know Puerto Rico um, is, uh, is a territory of the United States, and I will uh, talk a lot more in details about um, the island we are from, uh, but um, their, uh, their uh, cultural experience moving in the United States is very different, uh, but they also are a pretty large uh, group. Um, it is estimated that around uh, 5 million live in here in the United States, uh, and, uh, and they're pretty, uh, pretty proud. Um, so when we look at um, the landscape of, uh, of the, the Latin American, uh, communities. So we uh, we have some um, history concerning um, Mexico and in other experience. But you know, um, we always when we look at the at the map of the United States previous um, the Spanish American War, we we know that a great part of the United States uh, was also uh, part of Mexico. So there is a big um, big influence uh, in the, especially in the west side of the nation. Uh, we also will talk um, a little bit about um, the Cuban, um, in the Cuban American community, um, as uh, also uh, the politics and economics of that country um, influence uh, their immigrants here in the United States. And it will give us a, a different perspective of um, of how they're doing here. The same when we speak about uh, Latin America, we will talk about the differences um, between uh, Central America and South America um, and those patterns of immigration based um, on their historical um, perspectives. So and even looking at this graph here, you can kind of see the breakdown up until 2010 of the different regions of Latin America and what their effects of the, or how big the population population presence in the U.S. was. So as Gisela mentioned, Mexico definitely makes up the largest population, and that's been the case ever since the 1960s, but we do have an ever-growing number. Um, a lot of this is influenced by the political violence, by the gang violence, by the many different um, community traumas that take place in their, their country of origins that push them out of those countries seeking safety or a better life. So those are the things that we're gonna talk about as we move forward. So, and this PowerPoint also presents some of the context of trauma that have led to the massive uh, immigrations over the decades from Latin America and the Caribbean. So you have the context of Central America, which um, there has been significant amount of war um, and now in the new context, there's a lot of uh, gang violence happening. Um, in Mexico, there's a lot of cartel and drug violence. Um, there's an uh, incredible amount of political violence in Venezuela, where they have a quasi-communist dictatorship, even though they don't represent themselves as communists. Um, there have been multiple natural disasters that have impacted Puerto Rico, Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. Um, and, and these traumas are what are going to impact the notion of transition, the forced transition that these individuals are having to experience to come to a better world, to a better nation in terms of economics, in terms of safety. Um, and, 
and then the process of adaptability or integration or cultural integration that will take place within after um, that's, that immigration will also highly impact um, the individuals that you might be working with. So looking at the different mental health issues that you might encounter, it, it's going to be influenced by the diversity in the region and their experience with different traumas. Um, each region has experienced a unique set of traumas that could be influencing the way that they are experiencing their life and the world now. So understanding how the, that difference in experience is going to help to inform us and how we can best help them in, into overcoming the things that they are facing. So let's So discuss. I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, well, first, we, I know we kind of were uh, moved fast to that introduction, but we're going to now be more specific. Do you have any questions uh, for us before we move to the different uh, hi history of the region? Okay, so um, so when we talk about the, um, we, we kind of uh, divide it by, uh, by, by regions. I'm going to talk first about the Caribbean experience, um, because within the Caribbean, um, um, the experience is very, um, very uh, different. I'm also going to um, speak a little bit about, uh, and specifically about uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico and a little bit of Haiti. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and a, a little bit of Haiti, but definitely um, uh, we're gonna just go into into those details. So uh, when we look at um, at the at the Caribbean, uh, we know that they have a easy access um, to the United States. Um, they're um, they have very different skills levels based on. Uh, on where they're coming from, um, and um, and also how how they uh, get here. So we know um, in when we talk about the Caribbean, the people from the U.S. Virgin Islands and uh, Puerto Rico are not included uh, on those numbers because they are in um, they are part of the United States as territory. So um, so we are really not counted in those statistics as um, people from um, the Caribbean. The composition of the Caribbean is very diverse. Um, um, the, a lot of the uh, slave trades happen uh, from from Europe to um, the new colonies happen um, uh, started in the Caribbean. So we have a big influence of uh, African uh, African communities, also um, the natives of um, of the Caribbean islands. Um, and also a big influence of um, Spain, uh, France, in the case of Haiti, um, and some of the, um, I think, Holland and some of the, um, of the other um, small islands. Uh, but, you know, it's very interesting, it, it, within the Caribbean, it's very interesting to see all, all those diversities. Uh, most islands in the Caribbean speak Spanish, um, but they are, um, they are part of the Caribbean that speak other languages. Um, English is the primary language in um, Jamaica, but also, um, oh, can you go back? Yeah. Uh, but uh, French is the primary language language in Haiti. Um, we know the 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 immigrants that we received um, in the 1940s, 1950 for the Caribbean were, um, were mostly farmers or were people who were escaping um, political uh, repression in their countries. Um, so you have a pretty diverse group of people who, um, can I go back? Um, would you have a pretty group of people who, um, who, who escaped those countries? But now you have a, a, you have a different generation who are escaping um, 
poverty in the islands. A good example um, is Haiti. Haiti is considered to be the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And after the um, earthquake in 2010, um, we see a lot of the, um, that uh, increased significantly the population of Haitians um, in, in, in the country. So um, now we um, estimate uh, that uh, their population um, is still one of the lowest uh, incomes. And you may see most of them in the areas of New Jersey. They're also, yeah. they're also yeah. in New York City um, and Florida. Um, those are areas with a, a pretty uh, big Haitian population. Um, go next. Um, it, the case of Puerto Rico is very interesting and, you know, we can uh, be talking about it um, for a very uh, long time, um, but Puerto Rico was part of Spain until 1898. Um, and then uh, within a few months after the Hispanic, Amer the, the Spanish American War, uh, Puerto Rico um, became part uh, of the United States. Um, so we basically went from being one territory uh, to the other. In 1917, uh, Puerto Ricans actually earned um, their citizenship. So by birth, um, this new generation of Puerto Ricans are US citizens. So mobility to within the United States is very easy. You just get in a plane and get here. However, when we look at about acculturalization, um, we also uh, are mostly similar in terms of culture and language to our fellow friends from other Latin American countries. However, um, the, our political status sometimes cause a lot of conflict with other, with other countries um, and also it caused a lot of conflicts within uh, the American community. So sometimes and some um, experts in, uh, in Puerto Rican history uh, within the United States and political context will tell you it's almost like we don't belong to any of the groups. So the Puerto Ricans have definitely a, a very different uh, vision uh, politically and um, and an um, and influence here in the United States. Uh, we know a lot of uh, uh, Puerto Ricans have been used um, uh, for clinical trials. One of the best examples was, is the, uh, the trials of the pill. Um, they were using um, women in Puerto Rico who uh, were not very well educated and live in poor communities. And perhaps a lot of the information that was offered um, to conduct these trials uh, was actually uh, not pretty accurate. Um, so Puerto Ricans um, many times feel that they have been oppressed uh, many times um, by the United States. And um, doesn't matter what political affiliation you are in the island. Um, so it's always those um, those feelings that um, perhaps we are treated as um, second class citizens. Uh, we also know that Agent Orange um, uh, was a uh, trial in Puerto Rico, and um, it was actually uh, a store in the island uh, for a very long time. Uh, when we look at more recent history, we also know um, that Puerto Ricans. Uh, uh, were actually protesting um, the U.S. military because of practices that were uh, significantly associated with an increase of cancer um, in one of the smaller islands in the island of Puerto Rico. So there's always have been um, this um, kind of negativity uh, and controversial relationship with the United States, but then also within um, that Latin American community, we do struggle um, uh, to make, uh, to become part of it. Something that you will see within the, within the island um, changes is that you will see um, that um, the financial difficulties the island is having is causing a lot of the people to move here to the mainland. Um, we know that um, in our case, we also had suffered uh, significant natural disasters during the past um, a few years. We have Hurricane Maria um, that devastated the island of Puerto Rico in 2017 as the major uh, hurricane in the history of the United States and the Americas. 
Uh, and uh, Puerto Ricans just um, this year have been experiencing a lot of earthquakes uh, during the first um, parts of the, the 2020. Um, so when we look, uh, so, 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 and this had really had bring the immigration of Puerto Ricans um, uh, to the United States uh, to become um, significant to the point that um, in Florida, um, you know, uh, statistics said that uh, we actually decided part of the election in terms of the political power because once a, a Puerto Rican moved into the United States, immediately will have the right to vote, um, which make um, a big difference. And when we look at um, our political influences, uh, you will see that um, you will see several Puerto, uh, Puerto Ricans in Congress and representing um, our communities um, in those areas. When we look at Central America, Central America is a very uh, interesting uh, place. Uh, as um, Dr. Marquez was talking about, there is, um, there is really not um, a lot we learned about about Central America. Perhaps uh, there was not a lot I knew, even um, as as a Puerto Rican uh, working here in the United States. And I always having this this um, this uh, experience opened my mind that the fact of being bilingual is not enough that you also have to um, become bicultural, and then you also have to be sensible to ask questions in a very respectful way. Um, so you can, you can make that relationship with your client um, and establish those relationships that are very basic um, to see um, changes happening. Um, when we look at um, Central American history, we know that in the uh, late 70s and in the 70s, uh, most of the areas uh, experienced um, significant civil wars. Um, people uh, were definitely not very happy with their governments and um, they, they, just, uh, they just were kind of done. So uh, we have uh, significant crisis caused by that and consequently we know that a, a lot of people have uh, limited access to education they also have uh, significant uh, difficulties um, accessing care and that um, significantly influence um, the immigration of Central Americans into um, the United States going to back to that story I always I always talk about this, you know, I spent like a whole hour talking to this lady and um, I took all these notes and my coworker asked me, oh, how it went? And I said, well, um, I took a lot of notes. I didn't understand anything she said. So I have to uh, take a moment and, um, and, and realize I need to learn all this about her culture in order for me to uh, to provide access uh, to her. Um, so it was it was a lot of uh, learning, a lot of the language and the history to understand how I could help her better. And through I I am hoping to be able to give you a sense, or we're hoping to be able to give you a sense to the presentation. Not that it is so hard to work with the Latino community that even if you speak Spanish and are from the culture, it's difficult, but to the contrary, we're giving you this example so you will understand and feel comfortable saying to yourself, okay, even people that are from this culture have a hard time dealing with it within their own population because they're so diverse. So I don't need to feel bad if I make a mistake. I don't need to feel like I need to know everything, uh, but, the reality is, is, is sustaining the context of that humility of saying, okay, I made a mistake. Uh, I have gone to, pa to parents and to clients and apologize. Oh my God, I just said that word and that word is not a good word for you. And in my country, that doesn't mean that. And people understand, they laugh with me. Um, so you should not ever feel like you cannot learn from your parents or you should not feel like you cannot learn from your clients or you should not feel like you should not uh, ask questions or apologize because you're gonna be judged. Um, I think in the essence of culture, particularly with the Latino culture, you will always find that people smile when you try to speak their language, that people appreciate. I hear a lot of criticism of you saying, oh, I use Google Translate, and other people say, how did you use Google Translate to communicate? But for us, 
the fact that you're trying it speaks volumes to your desire to help. So a lot of times when I go to this type of cultural diversity trainings and cultural humility trainings, I hear people criticize one and the other person for different strategies that they try to use. But the reality is that the best strategy is being humble and trying and learning from your own patients, from your own clients. It is important that you are also not afraid of asking questions. At that point, I was definitely not comfortable doing that. Um, I just asked my can you hold back? I just asked my friend um, a lot about the, the history. I read more about you know I couldn't understand why this lady was not in school. It's like she's about my age. She never attended school. How that happened? Um, so you know I have to learn more about the word. I have to learn a lot about the language and even. After 20 years working with the Hispanic community, a mom will say something in the school that I don't understand. And I just ask um, something um, very interesting about these communities is that are very humble. Sometimes they don't share a lot of information with you. Um, and, uh, it, and it's because you're the one asking the question. So if you ask the general question, how are you doing? They probably will politely say they're doing great. Um, but they they really um, um, are open to to those questions. I have a case there uh, recently um, in my school, um, and I was as I was speaking with the mom, I quickly was able to identify the family didn't have insurance and they were having an issue with uh, food security. So um, when I was talking to the school counselor, she's like, "Well, how how do you know that?" And I said, "Well, I asked." Um, you know, the mom she was giving me enough hints for me uh, to, to, to just ask the questions. I said, hey, how are you guys doing about food? As the kids, are, do, how are the kids, um, do the kids have insurance? So these type of things are very important uh, for you to, to know and understand that perhaps uh, we also, um, that asking those questions is perfectly um, uh, fine. So when we look at the South America, it's actually uh, pretty interesting. We, um, they're actually the smallest population of Latin Isela, can I stop you for a second? Uh -huh, yeah, go ahead. Just, just to kind of take it back a little bit, it's also important to educate the, the populations you may encounter to what services are available in the yes. U.S. because they may not even know that those services are available. Um, I had a student who hadn't had access to ESOL services, didn't want to go to school because he didn't, wasn't being taught anything, didn't understand English, and the parents didn't know what to do because they couldn't figure out how to teach the child English because they didn't know English either. So sometimes it takes a little bit of that being able to take the first step and educate people on what services are available in the U.S. to be able to kind of drive that point home, home and be able to help them. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I always talk to them and the schools especially about their rights because in, in their countries there is not a lot of rights. Like you just uh, go and whatever that person is telling you to do, that's what you do. Um, so that's definitely something that you have to um, to educate them um, about uh, that. Um, as I was saying, you know, when we look at South America, the experience is a little different. Um, they definitely had experienced uh, war and they had experienced a lot of um, uh, political um, difficulties. But um, when they decide to immigrate, that they actually, I was actually surprised about this when I was doing the research. They actually don't immigrate mostly to the United States. They go to other places within the South America or either um, Europe and Canada. We are not their favorite place to come. Um, they were talking, uh, we talk about Venezuela. Um, uh, Venezuela definitely uh, is going uh, through significant uh, political changes right now. And um, there are people who are um, living um, Venezuela, because of the political situation and the economical situation, um, it is estimated that um, their population had grown significantly in the United States, um, it, and we can find most of them in the areas of uh, in the area of Florida. Um, okay. So, this is a topic that's particularly important with everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, Colorism within the, the Latinx community is, is interesting because it's almost this taboo that doesn't necessarily exist or isn't acknowledged um, in the community despite being so prevalent. Um, because of the history uh, of Latin America, between it being a hub for the slave trade, 
um, it being where a lot of people came to colonize, including the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the French. Um, there's a lot of mixing. There's a lot of mixing with people. Um, and you have very vast and different looking people living within Latin America. So understanding that to a degree kind of helps you put into context that not every client that walks in the door is going to look the same um, or have very similar experiences um, because of the way that they're, they get treated because of the skin color. So if we, here we go. So one of the things that happened with the initial mixing um, is something that is known as the castas, which is roughly translated to the caste system. Um, in that top left corner, you'll see some depictions of kind of status and how that was divided up in terms of what mixtures people had, how that established the, the status. Um, and that unfortunately kind of carried through even though it's been done away with formally. Um, where you have people who are lighter skin are more seen as being okay, whereas as you get darker, people are seen as being lower in status or not as worthy. So unfortunately, this is something that the Latino community continues to suffer with and continues to deal with. And you may have someone who is more of an Afro-Latinx um, descent that may experience that they're not really accepted as part of the Latinx community. So then you have multiple factors that you're working against in terms of saying you can't, you're not really identifying with your Latinx community. You don't feel accepted by them, but you're also not accepted by the American community. So where do you go from there and understanding the different challenges that affect that population as well. Um, so looking, so one of the things that, that comes to mind for me is, you know, even discussions I've had with my own family members or friends on Facebook in terms of what's going on with the George Floyd protests and how that's being represented in the Spanish media. Um, recently, there's been a lot of calling out of Univision and Telemundo, which are the primary places that people get their, their news media in the, in the Latinx community for the way that they've been reporting this as being violent protests or things are being thrown out of control when that's not necessarily the case. Um, and looking at it from the perspective of whose fight is this, or should we stand up, should we say something? So encouraging people to understand that this isn't a color thing necessarily. Um, this is more about what is right in terms of ending police brutality, and that's the way that it should be reported versus it just being solely erased. Um, so that's one of the, I'd say the, one of the more pressing issues that we're facing within the Latinx community at this precise moment in time. So moving into immigration, um, and we've kind of touched on these a little bit. Um, some of the ways that we, we want to kind of frame things or how things are framed within the academic literature is understanding why people are leaving their, their countries of origins in the first place. You have push migration, which is equates to people being pushed out of their countries. It's the factors that are forcing someone to want to leave or to leave their, their country of origin, so war poverty, um, gang violence, those sort of things. Pull migration are the things that attract people to want to, to go to the different countries. So for a lot of people that becomes the US because it seemed as this beacon of hope and the place where you can make your dreams come true. Um, within that, you have internal migration and external migration. So Gisela touched on this a bit for the Puerto Rican community moving to the U.S. is considered internal migration because they are a part of the U.S. They're not leaving necessarily a nation that they, that they, to another nation that they are not a part of. Whereas external migration would be more along uh, the lines for the Central American and South American countries where they are leaving and joining a completely new society. But even then, there's different nuances into the way that those migrations are moved. And conflict between the different nations. So as Gisela was saying, people may see the Puerto Rican experience as being internal migration and they don't have any difference between moving from Puerto Rico to the U.S. Um, compared to somebody coming from El Salvador and going to the U.S., but that may not necessarily be the case as well. So part of the, the reason why I wanted to talk about assimilation a little bit is because we have this notion of assimilation in the US or things get thrown out in terms of how fast someone needs to assimilate into the country when they move here. 
Um, for a long time, we looked at things simply being this uh, straight line assimilation theory, which is basically as the generations go on and on, people will become more used to living in the U.S. and will adapt to the ways that that or the culture that we have here in the U.S. So we shouldn't expect that someone who just moved here to completely adapt to the U.S., but their children are going to adapt more. And that's going to continue on and on. But as we've actually studied this, we've seen that this actually changes a little bit. And we're more into looking at things in terms of the segmented assimilation theory, um, which is looking at how different groups assimilate in different facets. So part of that is that we have this upward assimilation and that kind of goes uh, along the same lines of that straight line theory that people will start adopting to US customs and then start getting rid of their old customs and slowly they will become more and more Americanized forgetting their, their older ways. Um, but that is kind of seen with having a lot of conflict and kind of losing a little bit of the identity that people have. Um, downward assimilation, and that's, that's more the dissonance that people have in terms of a child may assimilate to the U.S. customs more than their parents will. But that gets tied with a lot of different conflict within that family because you have the child who only wants to speak English because he's lived in America his whole life, and the parents who only want to speak Spanish and they want to do things a certain way and you have this conflict within the home so that might be important for for you all to know in terms of what is going on within the household does the client no longer see himself as a member of of his family's identity or culture and have they just kind of is that causing a lot of conflict in the home um ideally we want to promote a lot of this upward mobility which is where parents and, and children are going to adopt us customs at the same rate um, but they're also going to keep that culture that they came from. Um, and that shared respect of that culture and, and, and kind of growing up together is gonna to result in less conflict between the child and the parent as they grow up and as they assimilate. Um, but it's also kind of shown to kind of lead to a lot or better success as they grow up and as they become more acultured and a part of the society here in the US. Can you guys speak to, I have a question. Can you speak to the, dynamic of um let's say a, a you know a provider goes into a home and, and and the parents don't speak english the kids do um and really out of desperation they have the child be the translator well, yeah could you speak to that a little bit i All mean right. that was my life existence um probably still is I'm still seen as the translator for the entire family in terms of going through all the documents and, and everything um, from looking at banking information and contracts when I was like, well, um, it's common. It, it's done almost out of desperation, but I, I think it's done in, in a way because it's not just necessity, but it's also like the trust and the community within the Latino com community. So because we're so close knit, we're seen as kind of participating in everything together. Everything becomes this family decision. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to involve outside forces because we don't want to seem as people who need, need things or are, are a burden to the community. Um, I, would, I would state that we're probably seeing that a little bit more even now because of the current state of politics that people don't want to be perceived as being a burden or having to need things um, just out of fear of possible repercussions that may come down the line because of that. Yeah, uh, in terms of therapy, I have multiple bilingual therapists in practice, but I also have uh, multiple non-Spanish speaking therapists in practice. I only speak English. And, and this is a commonality, the notion of uh, having to figure out how to interpret for them because in many situations when we have used the child to translate for the parent uh it turns out that the child is not giving the whole picture information or is omitting things that are convenient for the child not to mention uh this has happened also to Gisela uh, and she catches them and I catch them when they do that I'm like that's not what I said <laughs> what are you saying right now uh, or, or you, you left a lot of information that I wanted to convey to your parents, right? Uh, or that the therapist was trying to convey to the parent. Um, so, so it is, it is complex, 
Uh, another phenomena that we have seen a lot in the schools is that the people that are used for interpretation or translation are family members. Uh, we see it also with a lot of our physicians until we started using our access line um, that they're family members, but then they don't, they're afraid to say certain things to the person in terms of their health or their mental health, or then the person feels uncomfortable because they were not aware that this conversation was going to be held with this interpreter who's a family member. And now uh, the whole family is in their business because that person is not held to confidentiality, neither he or FERPA. So they go and they share all of this information with other family members. And then it, 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 it comes back to the therapist, it comes back to the provider, to the physician with the notion of, well, you broke my trust. And we're like, well, you brought this interpreter who's your family member. We have no control of what they share. So with that type of dynamic, we, we, we discourage completely for, for our patients to use family members as interpreters. When, we embrace the notion of using a language line or, or hiring providers that are um, linguistically capable of communicating in the native tongue. Mm -hmm. Even, even, and this I'm going to jump outside of the of the Latino community for a, for a moment. Uh, even though it has happened with our Latino clients, when we use the language line, um, if for example somebody is from um, Honduras and somebody else is from Mexico, there is this, there are these uh, cross cultural arguments or cross national arguments where people feel that, well, that person is from that country, they're going to judge me because they're from that country. Or uh, I don't feel comfortable talking to that interpreter because I know that their country has been in conflict with my country and they have had wars for many years. So all of those things happen. And, and as providers, we need to navigate this uh, maze of dynamics to accommodate the needs of, of the different diverse populations that we see. I want to add that um, when you're using an interpreter, well, best practices, as Dr. Marquez was saying, is to um, use somebody that speaks the same language um, uh, that the person. Um, that, in some cases, I actually sometimes had seen that that perhaps is, is actually not the best option. I actually have been in meetings in where we have a professional translator or interpreter in the meeting and the person is not really communicating what we're saying. And the reason I know that is because I speak the language and I have to interrupt and clarify. So I always, um, when I use, um, because I'm in the school system, we have kids from all over the world. Um, I experience using the, the translators or the language line um, eh, to working with interpreters of other languages. So something I, I try to do first is not to rush, um, to, to be able to ask questions. Like if something they're saying doesn't make any sense to you, it is okay to ask for clarification um, because so, and you also have to understand the context of, 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 the, of the person. And, you know, this is kind of deviating uh, from, the, from, from what we're talking about today, that is the Latin community. But I have a lady from um, Afghanistan uh, recently. The school counselor is there, the teacher is there, and the administrator of the school. And they're concerned that the child is not sitting in his seat, he's jumping around. Uh, but, you know, we're, uh, they're asking the normal questions. If he went to school, how was that? But the first thing I'm thinking is like, well, Afghanistan, he is probably a refugee. He, um, they came here and who knows what he experienced because he was attending school. Is this, so I have all these questions that I have to um, ask the interpreter to ask mom because otherwise, that conversation will not happen. So, so feel free to, to um, although you have that third person in the room, you are the one who are um, leading the conversation. So it is okay to ask questions if you're not sure the parent or is understanding. You know, what struck me when you, when you, when you just, from what you just said was that it's so important to understand the context of how people come over, why people come over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'm thinking about that, that, that youth from Afghanistan and, you know, I've got all kinds of questions in my head, you know, what, yes. um, you know, it was this, you know, first of all, how did, 
um, they get let in, right? Given our current administration, just thinking out loud. And then um, it, was this um, a, a child of a translator? Mm -hmm. um, was this a military? I don't know, you know, what happened here? Um, because it, it adds such um, additional context to, you know, how you want to help them. Yeah, that was nice. I thank you. And even the resources that they might be able to access just because of those single questions that you said. Yeah, and you know, the teacher main concern is like he's not sitting. I'm like, really? No, like, like I need to know all these things to know why he's not sitting in his chair. I'm not saying that perhaps he doesn't have a difficulty and this is why he's not sitting, but we need to rule out all these things first. But if if I didn't know that, you know, Afghanistan had gone through this big war and that they have this conflict within the United, with the United States, right? all these issues that his father might be here or was working with the United States, this is how he's here, he had lived it. So without me knowing all these things, I wouldn't be able to ask those questions. I would go. The teacher was just seeing a little boy who's not sitting in his chair all day. <laughs> right. Uh, I had a, a young man that Francisco and I were together mm -hmm. in this case, and he said I was, oh. was the one that referred us. And this young man, so contextually, and I guess this is the emphasis that I want to give to why we're giving you this historical background, is the idea that even though we're using language that is familiar to us in context, in maybe the idea what these people are seeing every day in terms of trauma does not get clearly defined, documented research within our, our culture, within our scientific, psychological studies. Even uh, I'm an ACES, uh, I'm an ACES trainer uh, under Dr. Landa, Landa and um, when, when we talk about the trauma that these people are living and they type of life that they're having to experience day to day before immigrating to the United States, it doesn't have a comparison. Mm -hmm. So when we're saying limitation to education, perhaps we think about, well, it's a school that doesn't have books. Or, no, no, no. We're talking about a rural place where everybody in this little town has to walk with that joke that our grandparents used to make, oh, I had to walk barefoot up a hill, uh, to school every day in, in, the the middle, in the middle of the snow. <laughs> so these people literally have to walk barefoot up a hill to get to a school where everybody from all ages are learning the same thing because there's only one teacher for, I don't know, 20 kids that are, are managing to get there because the other 50, 60, 100 kids that live in that community have to stay and help in the household with taking care of the little ones, with taking care of farming, with taking care of the little shops that people uh, build up to kind of survive. So many of these children might have, many of these parents uh, might have uh, first, second grade education. Many of the kids that we see might have up to third grade education, but they, we're placing them, and this takes me back to the story that I wanted to make. This child is being placed on the seventh grade, and he had only gone to school to the third grade in a very unstructured environment where he would learn maybe two, three hours of the day and then go spend the rest of the day playing with cows, uh, throwing rocks and snakes, hanging out with uh, goats and just dancing for money because he was a very good dancer and he would go to an area where there was a lot of people and he's the little kid dancing. So, and he, he's getting validated by other adults with this dance, right? And all of a sudden he gets referred to us because he's uh, hyperactive and he cannot sit still. And he walks out of the, rest, the classroom and he just walks away and walks to the principal office and starts dancing for the principal. <laughs> well, he's doing what he learned, right? <laughs> he's behaving in the way that he had been validated by adults until that point. I learned a couple of hours. I did what I needed to do for one, two hours. What do you mean you want me to sit there for eight hours or six hours? No, I'm going to go to the head of the school and I'm going to dance for her so she will leave me stay in her office and she will give me some candy, right? So this is what he learned all his life. So he comes to me and we start working on, on what is the structure now? What, how are we going to change for you to be able to sit still in a classroom that is very structured, that as you're learning a language, 
uh, that is foreign to you, why would you even want to sit there for two, three, four hours if you cannot even understand what the people are saying, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we will talk a lot more about that in terms of treatment and also when Dr. Marquez was talking about uh, the research, um, because even when we look at, um, and we will talk about psychological testing, um, especially when you have a student who is in the school system and be, is being evaluated um, to determine whether or not they have a disability, um, you know, some of the tests will say, yeah, we are representative of the Hispanic American communities, but perhaps they are more representative of children like my children, who are children of two professionals, who are in a household um, that uh, speak both languages. So when we, when we look at the representation, we're really not representing um, the people who are, we're not counting. And this is what I mentioned earlier about the statistic. Is, to see if the statistics are even available because you know remember that a lot of these um these individuals we're talking about are individuals who are undocumented within the united states so they're not counted so so i have a follow yes. moment do you have a question yeah um this reminds me of our trauma-informed care training that we gave and a lot of it is circled around trauma as we think about it within the United States. I'm wondering if we, have, been, have you done anything as it relates to trauma-informed care for worldwideness? You know, whether it's war that people have been in, whether it's been because of a cartel, because of things which I don't think our trauma-informed care even anywhere gets to any of the things that you've been talking about. So you'll be happy to know that to, in between today and our next session, we will cover trauma-informed care within the Latino community. And we will touch the notion of the effect that the military, the military, the gang violence, the immigration, the violence in the process of immigration, what is the effect that, that this has on people in terms of trauma and their behavioral and neurological effects that this has on children and adults as well. Um, this would segue into this um, PowerPoint that we have had here holding for a minute. The, within the Latino community, research supports that there is a higher degree of propensity toward trauma. And a lot of people in the research, in our research field, do not understand that. And this is why we wanted to bring this context to you all, because this is why people in our communities are more uh, predisposed to experiencing PTSD. Uh, because all of the ex lived experience to get to the place that they are now in the United States, think about this from the neurological perspective, you are in a state of hyperarousal, living with cortisol running in your brain at a higher density than the average person, always trying to survive, and all of a sudden, when you finally get to a place where you feel you're going to be safe, then you need to acculturate and you need to deal with the challenges of immigration and acculturation. And as that happens and things start evolving, you get to a point where you finally can sit back and say, okay, let me experience life. And then all of the trauma from the past that you have not been treated for, that you have not had a moment to process because you've been living it day in, day out, hits you. And then you start decompensating in symptomatology of depression and anxiety and PTSD once you are in a place that you were like, okay, finally I got to, to a better state of, of, of living. Now I am experiencing depression and anxiety and, and anger. And then people start drinking and people start using drugs and people start using different things to cope with the pain that they're bringing. So I'm really happy you brought that up. Um, because we, we're going to definitely touch on that. Something that I see a lot because I work with the younger group of, of, his, of Latinos is that because of what Ramfis was saying, they don't realize, they live in these chaos all their lives. So they don't realize that this is not typical. So you might even ask them, they, anything significant had happened to you? And they will say, no. 
I'm like, well, walking all the way from Honduras here, I, I think it will be pretty significant for me if I have to hide or cross the river. So I personally, as a psychologist, try to take a proactive approach. Um, and I think working, and we will talk more about how we can work with community, in, in communities. So when a parent is telling me all this story about these kids, I immediately said, oh, how about I make a referral for you to go see a counselor who can deeply talk to the family about these issues? Because the reality is that if we are not proactive, we will continue seeing that cycle of violence, um, alcohol use, drug abuse. So. I feel, uh, and, and you know, I always talk with my parent liaison about this, it's almost like understanding what is coming next is going to help you be proactive in the process, not waiting until these kids get to high school or middle school because you know what is going to happen. Um, so just being proactive with the families and explaining how they can access care so we can prevent this from happening. So. Our, our current state of care provides for a limited amount of time where we can work with our patients. Uh, be it in your system, that for what I understand is about 30 days long, give or take, or for our system in intensive in-home or our system in uh, outpatient services, there are limitations in how much time we can work with our patients. But when you have somebody that has experienced trauma, from the moment that they were born until the moment that they crossed the border and then acculturation, which is traumatic in itself, and then just leaving everything behind and they finally get to you, 30 days, 90 days, the context of the average treatment modality is not enough. Um, and, and we see it on the sequela of treatment that takes place, particularly when I, I see a lot of little kids that once I discharge them, I try to hold on to them as long as I can. One year, two years, if possible, but eventually I have to discharge them. And once I discharge them, when they come into puberty, many of the things that have happened to them uh, start resonating again and start coming back and start evolving into different uh, symptomatologies that are being diagnosed as depression and anxiety, but they are the, the trauma that is coming back at that stage of development when the neural cortex starts to reconfigure itself. Um, so for example, this young man, Jose Segovia Benitez, that Francisco is going to share his story with us in a minute, is a young man that suffered from PTSD. Did, when he joined the military, he served in the military, he was exposed to violence in war, he had a history before joining the military, and all of a sudden he comes out of the military, which in itself uh, had already given him the war exposure that brings many of our soldiers with PTSD back, does not receive proper care from the VA, uh, does not have access to care in the community, takes on this new lifestyle of violence because that's what he has learned from the background and that's what we indoctrinate our soldiers to do. Uh, reintegrating from the military for me, for example, I served in the Navy for some time and reintegrating to the context from uh, military to civilian life was hard. It's a whole different context of living. The structure is completely different. Um, so, so I can only imagine coming back with a, a background of uh, early childhood negative experiences or ACEs uh, and then having been exposed to war and then having to reintegrate into an environment that is not, is not fully uh, accessible to navigate in, in terms of care. I'll let Francisco speak a little bit about Jose because I think this, uh, def Jose defines a lot of what our young children eventually come into adulthood and experience. So, and a lot of it is that context of this is a a multifaceted issue. It, it's not just the military career, it's that his history in El Salvador and all the negative experiences he had as a child, all the negative experiences he likely faced coming here and then having an undocumented status or a conditional status, not being able to access resources that sometimes we, we take for granted or we assume that someone in the military can get. Um, and then the whole military concept is a training in itself in terms of can they, can they actually access mental health resources? 
without being barred from future potential jobs or being disowned from the military, essentially. So that combination of, of the, the systemic tra trauma he had faced in his home country coming here and then no longer being able to access those resources that would help him with the PTSD and the TDI led to him being being violent. There's the cultural aspect of the, the machismo, which we'll dive further into, but um, domestic violence is very common within the Latino community. So understanding that what may be acceptable or what he may have grown up viewing as acceptable um, in his home country, and then he comes here and does that, he's punished for it, he does jail time for it, and then on top of that, he gets deported out of the country. Um, El Salvador is a country, it's changing a little bit now um, with the new president, but for a long period of time, it was one of the most deadliest countries you could go to. So his presence of military tattoos were practically a death sentence for him because any sort of tattoos are immediately going to be assumed to be gang tattoos. That's just the culture there in El Salvador. So the fear is now he's being deported to El Salvador, he is more than likely going to get killed just for simply having military tattoos that, that represent his devotion to our country here. So it's complex issues that, that are kind of compounded by multiple different systems and multiple different issues that we're hopefully going to, to kind of help you all understand a little bit further. And that, so, so far, any questions? I have a follow-up. Um, and thank you for those examples. I mean, I think this highlights, you know, Wilma's point about, um, you know, trauma-informed care in the United States, you know, going to the typical trauma training will not get into this level of detail and the, and the, and the impact of, of the cultural experience on trauma doesn't really necessarily get told. Yes. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think... That's something we see um, frequently. When I talk to other um, psychologists, and I often um, discuss uh, those concerns, because uh, when we are evaluating kids or working with kids, if you don't have that sensibility, and you know, I apply it to everybody I work with, because I think that experience that I have with that lady uh, from El Salvador taught me a lot about what I didn't know. Um, yeah, I speak Spanish, but if I speak my Spanish and she speaks her Spanish, we will never be able to communicate. So, um, and I will never achieve um, trying to help her so she can move on. Um, so, so I think that really opened um, my eyes as a practitioner more than working with people who are on privileged communities. It just, it, it just was a very different situation because we were both speaking the same language, but we really were not. So I think that, that it is important to understand those, those differences because I would not know otherwise. So, so and then I had a separate question. Um, you know, Hazella, you might be able to help me out in, in terms of being a school psychologist. So when a youth comes here, maybe with, I don't know, they belong in the, they, they, their age says they belong in the seventh grade and yet language or developmentally or because of trauma, they're really functioning at, at a different grade level altogether. Mm -hmm. um, should we as providers be thinking immediately about do they qualify for any kind of a special education um, classification and or you know uh, accommodations? Um, I actually enjoy talking about that topic because definitely uh, we need to and I will I have a whole um, a, presentation when we talk about interventions uh, about that, what to do about that. But something very interesting is, well, each state managed this in a different way. Um, Virginia, Maryland, DC, we're in a consortium, so we use um, the same tests across all this area and basically the same system. 
So when the kids arrive to the United States, we evaluate them um, to determine what language they, um, how they are proficient in English. Most of them are not. So that will, in a, in a scale of one to six, that will qualify them as a one. Um, in some countries, some counties, I'm sorry, like within Virginia, not the county where I am, but in Fairfax County, which is a very diverse county, they actually evaluate the student proficiency in their native language. That's something I like a lot because you not only know what is the proficiency in the in, in English that will of course will be known, but you also will know the student proficiency in their native language because for and this is the whole presentation for for another day. But when we learn um, about language acquisition, if you are not educated your your language acquisition in your native language will determine your level of language acquisition in the second language um so so there is a close relationship so if you have a student who had never been in school who uh, perhaps uh live with parents who are illiterate well his his level of education in his native language will be limited too so um so that will also determine how this how fast the student will learn if you are limited in both languages you know your language acquisition of the English of the English language will take a little longer. Uh, but if you are a, perhaps a student like my daughter who already was bilingual um, and they have bilingual parents, uh, her language feels out of the ESO program in two years. So all those things definitely need to be considered. And um, and I, I always said gather as much information as you can. Is the student have any difficulties with the developmental milestones? Um, because, well, some approaches, what happened, and we were talking about this morning, uh, is that it goes into the extreme. So there's the people who believe we should not test these kids, and there's the people who believe we should just treat them as any other student. So, but there is no gray on it. Um, there's no gray, it's black and white. And um, I see a lot of gray sometimes, but the, that is because of my experience. Um, I have a case of a student um, that uh, clearly has autism. He's flapping his hands, he's making no eye contact, he's throwing a tantrum. Um, I, he had actually a diagnosis of, from his country, and when I was trying to communicate with the Department of Special Education, we had to rush to do an evaluation so he can be placed appropriately. They're like, well, but how about we wait a little? And I said, well, he clearly is disabled. So we also have to be very careful because then that will that can limit access uh, for some kids who have truly, truly have disabilities. So I always talk, um, we have a forum I belong in Facebook that I always talk about, you know, we also have to be very cautious with that because there are there are disabilities in other countries. So we have to be open. To the perspective of being um, being able to then gather the information uh, in the most fair way, so we can analyze that data and determine is this really a disability or this is a cultural difference. So um, I'm, I'm more of a I cannot defend uh, unless you know it's a clear case like the autistic uh, boy I was referring or somebody with an intellectual disability that is an adult that clearly has an intellectual disability but for me as a psychologist without doing the testing it's hard for me to really tell you um, so I'm always open to doing the assessments um, but I think analyzing the assessments and having the discussion about the findings is, is something that I found to be very important um, because um, because of, of that, the kid might have a true disability, but we're not giving them access to the services. And that's something that we found with some of the minority communities. Right. And, and, Thank you. And I guess the context of extremes always comes to mind. When I was doing intensive in-home, I had a situation with a client who his intensive in-home worker was a psychologist from Puerto Rico who was pursuing his license here. Uh, and I was the clinical supervisor in the case. This child had significant language delays in Spanish. Um, therefore, he was having a very hard time learning English. We communicated this for to the school, and they provide they, they, the school counselor and social worker and school psychologist argue back and forth with us about the notion of well, but maybe it's just the fact that he's learning a new language. Um, he doesn't need to be in special education, he needs to be in English as a second language. 
And I told her, I am evaluating him in his native language. And I'm telling you, he has severe language delays in his native language. So, so it, is a, it is a very difficult path to navigate sometimes because of that context of uh, unless you have somebody that can provide that extra level of information, you might, you might be thinking I'm doing the right thing by not jumping the gun and automatically saying special education, he needs extra support, which is never bad if the ch child needs it. But then where do I draw the line of that versus uh, just a, a, something as simple as English as a second language is what this child needs right now. Yeah, and it's, it, it is important um, also in the background, especially for services. So um, also I, I did struggle with this for a little bit that I had a supervisor back um, a few years ago and she will say, but can, can your experiences make you disabled? And I actually struggled for many, many years with that. That's something I see with children, especially related to trauma, is that trauma truly can make you disabled. Um, and you have kids who you may not be ever, ever answer the question, did this kid have developmental, appropriate developmental um, milestones? But then you have this child that have been in the United States, um, let's say six years, um, it is struggling to learn English. It is struggling to um, it is struggling to process school. But then when but then when you look at the history of like I do an IQ test on this kid and I say, well, this kid is not um, it's not the, it doesn't look the same at the numbers. These numbers are coming too low, and the kid here socially he is not intellectually disabled. Well, then then you have to stop and say, well, the, it's the trauma really causing these difficulties in learning. Um, and I actually within the years have um, qualified some students at, um, at in our state in Virginia. Um, Trauma will be probably an emotional disability because that's the manifestation of anxiety, depression, type thing behaviors. Um, but I do have uh, work with students who have qualified for special education um, because of their significant trauma. And, um, and you know, I just have tried to advocate for them not to be put in, in places that are not appropriate, um, but I, I do have seen it. And it's like, can I explain their IQ scores? Not really. There's no research um, to explain it. But I do know as a practitioner that trauma significantly impacts cognition. Um, and that is kind of that significance um, in this per person's lives. So, um, you know, it's kind of looking at the gray. This, that would be, Ramfi said we should write a presentation about that um, this morning when we were talking about it. Because, yeah. you know, the, it is true with a lot of kids who qualify for services. And I'm like, how this kid qualify? Are you kidding me? But there, there is also the other side of the spectrum. So we need to be very careful with that. Right. As an outside provider that supports our clients in the school system, sometimes I need to make the recommendation to the parent, listen, the system has these limitations and your child is going to only get extra support if he's labeled within this context. So there is some systems have the emotional disability context that will provide some degree of support. Some systems have 504 plans. Some systems have the IEPs and some systems use all of them and some systems try to avoid some of them. So understanding how your educational system works and what levels of support your child might actually have, uh, depending on what specialized service or label is given after an evaluation, is actually extremely beneficial for providers supporting the child into the context of the school uh, and their grow educational growth. Um, any, did, did that answer kind of that context question? Yes, it does. It does. And as you guys go to the next slide, I want you to think about um, how does peer-to-peer um, -peer support, either family peer support or youth peer support or, or you know, uh, just support in the Latino community, um, how does that fit into some of the cultural differences? Yes, we, we're going to actually talk about, a lot about that when we get to the teaming model. 
<laughs> the uh, family teaming model that we use for, for treatment. Um, but I think it's very important to involve national support systems in the life of all of our clients uh, to ensure that one, they, they are supported outside of our clinical care. Two, our job as clinicians is always to work with the person so they won't need us. I joke with my clients, my job is for you to fire me and be happy about firing me. I don't want you to feel like you need to stay with me the rest of your life. I want you to fire me and be happy about it. But not because I'm a bad clinician, but because I was a good clinician to you. Um, um, so within that context, the only way, the best way, not the only way, the best way that I found to do that is by ensuring that I am giving a lot of extra support in the natural environment of the client and I'm teaching a lot of resiliency skills that my client might not have. Resiliency skills in the context of coping mechanisms, resiliency skills in the context of learning how to access resources in the community, resiliency skills in terms of learning to communicate. Um, we, we're moving into a space in the presentation where I want to start integrating what we, what we have discussed so far into the context now of the family nucleus. nucleus. And uh, that context then is explored within the differences. Do you want to help me with the presentation, sir? This is my cat, Louis. <laughs> Hi, Louis. Uh, um, there are many things that are going to impact the care of your clients when they are within the, within the, within the family as you access the family. One thing, and this is why we brought all of these subjects of um, events in the life of the, our clients in the past, past events or historical events or sociocultural events. One thing is that they will always see you coming into their home as somebody from the government. Even if you're a private provider, <laughs> even if you have nothing to do with the government, even if you have one of those stickers that say, I don't work for the government, <laughs> they will always think that you're part of the government. And understand that being part of the government in many of the Latino cultures that you're going to work with is not a good thing. The government punishes people. The government hurts people. The government makes people disappear. The government puts people in jail for no reason whatsoever. Well, and this is part of the the same going back to the history perspective like if you are from cuba the government owns everything in cuba right mm -hmm. they own the theater they own the stores they own everything so they from them it's like it's the citizens and the government there's not really anything in the middle um a lot of, of these these families so they they really don't um understand the system um in, in the way that that we we work so definitely uh, teaching them and teaching them how to use um, the available resources within their community um, will be key to see those communities um, is you know flourish something uh, with COVID and we will talk a little bit more about COVID and the impact in the um, Hispanic and Latino community but something I have seen in the community in the school I work with is that um, the parents are just helping each other and they're letting us know like you know uh, so and so um, need food so and so need this um, and you know the, the work of um, of working together in school as volunteers had helped re, uh, create those relationships. So they're helping each other um, when we cannot get there. So, um, so just to start giving context to the to the differences or the diversity between uh, the Anglo culture and the Latino culture, for example, and these are general contexts. This is not uh, by no means this is this is how it is, and this is what I emphasize the notion of ask and explore and don't feel bad about it. Learn from your client, from the expert of the case, which is your client and his, her family. Um, so the, the Anglo community tends to be very nuclear in nature. Uh, the, the Latino community is nuclear, but it also has the extended family component. So in a, in a household of Latinos, you might have two, three, four generations of people and first cousin and third cousin living in the same household. 
And in many situations, first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, and everybody's referred to as, that's my brother. So that differentiation. My cousin, everybody's uh, my cousin. Or, or, or somebody that came and immigrated with me and now is living with me, that's my cousin. And you're like, my God, there's so many brothers and sisters. But uh -huh. when, you, when you start asking, no, they're not, they don't have the last, same last name. And you start wondering what is happening here. And it's, it's that context of everybody in the community is more like a clan type of uh, dynamic than, than a nuclear family type of dynamic. Um, so you will find that a lot. In, in the context of uh, religion and spirituality, uh, many of our parents in the Latino community believe in the context of divine intervention, like many Anglos do. But beyond that, the context of spiritual intervention in the day-to-day -day is a absolute reality. Um, I, for, I, for example, give this uh, example, Rick, you've heard this before, uh, of a client that we had uh, that went to the hospital because she was having panic attacks. And she told the attending psychiatrist who has psychiatrist who was an intern that she was going to be fine because the Virgin Mary was there with her. Um, and this is being translated, right? So the, an interpreter is giving this interpretation. Uh, the Virgin Mary was there, and when asked, well, how do you know that the Virgin Mary is here? She said, well, I can smell flowers, I can smell roses, uh, and I know she's here accompanying me, and I'm going to be fine, and she's going to cure my illness. And when the client comes back for what was panic attacks and anxiety, she comes back with the diagnosis of schizophrenia because she was psychotic and delusional. So for this woman within this religious context, the Virgin Mary was present because many of our parents believe that the manifestation of the divine, of angels. I've talked to people that, have, that truly believe that around me they will see angels and they will see angels that are protecting me. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess thank you. You see angels around me, but it has nothing to do with psychosis. That has to do with ingrained cultural beliefs that perhaps because I am such a troublemaker or because I'm a really good person, I might have angels around me protecting me, right? Um, so within that same context, there's a notion of autonomy uh, within the Anglo community that sometimes does not necessarily show in the Latino community. They, I, I give an example of a, a, a client that we had who his counselor was encouraging this kid, you need to go to college and you need, you're very good at math and you're, you should be an architect and I'm gonna help you get all of these grants and all of these things. And the counselor is doing his best to move this kid to college. And the child, the, the teenager goes to the parents and he's like, well, I wanna go to college. And the parents look at him and he's like, you're not gonna go to college, you're gonna be a mechanic like me. I've worked all my life to build a business for you as a mechanic and I want you to be a mechanic. And this became a huge conflict for the, the teenager, the father and the counselor. And I had to be involved and negotiate and try to communicate to the father. I know that this is your dream, but your child also has a dream, right? And, and, and it became very, very polarized at one point, even within the context of the family, because they felt that this young man who was trying to embrace our independence as a uh, Latin American, uh, Anglo-American born uh, young man versus his father, who was an old school, patriarchal, somewhat machista male, and he had already set up a picture in his mind of what he wanted his son to do. Um, there's a context of communication also. Um, in the Latino community, direct communication between an adult and a child or a teenager is not, is not a commonality. There's, there, there's no level of equality. Uh, you're supposed to look down, uh, but at the same time, they might scream at you and say, when I'm talking to you, look at me in the eyes. Uh, don't look at me in the eyes. So it, it's kind of a, a very interesting dynamic of power and control that happens. And you as a teenager, for example, cannot just go and tell your father how you feel or 
what you feel or what your expectations are um, unless you're actually asked. Uh, and sometimes you're never asked. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of subtle communication uh, that are used through metaphors and jokes and proverbs and different stories that are given in terms of the learning. Um, there's also, the, the, within that same context, the type of business-like dynamic that happens between parents and children. Uh, the communication, because many of our parents in the Latino community have not experienced mm, the love languages, how we experience it here in the United States, uh, they have very business-like demeanors with their kids. Uh, and on the opposite side, on the flip side, many of our parents go to a, a, an opposite place when they move uh, from their countries where they want to give their children everything that they did not receive. So then they go overboard with things that in many ways impact the child in a way that does not allow the child or the teenager to embrace responsibilities and embrace uh, uh, growth, emotional growth, because they have what we will refer to as perhaps a, a helicopter parent around them, protecting them all the time. Um, does that make sense? Questions so yeah. far? It does. It might be a good time just to take a, a five, 10 minute break just to give people a chance to um, actually just go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, sure. Five minutes break works for me. And then we'll come back and, and, and uh, join back in with the family system dynamics. That's very good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, hey. raise her hand. It showed that you raised your hand. I wonder, uh, do you have a question? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's a question so much as it is a statement. So I am a, ca a Caucasian female social worker that doesn't speak Spanish. And some of the things you're talking about really concern me about how I could be helpful with cultural beliefs and is is what I'm going to say, how much of what I say is going to have an impact on like you were talking about the kid that wanted to go to college. Like I'm thinking that you being able to talk to the dad about it is way, way different than me being able to talk absolutely, to the dad about absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, 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 and yes, that is a reality in that context of the patriarchalism and the machismo that they will absolutely listen to me in a way that they probably would not listen to you. I would, and I guess this is one of the other reasons that we're going to go into that context of how to navigate the world of machismo and the world of the patriarchal structure to, to give you some hints on how you could. Okay, good. <laughs> because even within the patriarchal culture of the Latino community, matriarchalism is existent. So if you, if you align yourself with mom, and mom is your your partner, and you start communicating from there, the woman has a lot of power in the context of getting the husband to change his mind. Got it. Getting the husband to listen to the notion of this person is trying to help us. So okay. You just listen. So uh, I have to tell you, one of the families I was working with, the teenager spoke English, the dad spoke English and Spanish, and the mom didn't speak any English at all. So, uh, but that's good to know for future reference. Thank you. Some females that I found um, to establish those relationships of respect, it's just, just to let them talk. At first, I don't, I kind of, you know, just listen. Um, and then I know if, my approach should be quick or I should wait. Um, something very interesting that I found, you know, I, I have to deal with um, something like, you know, telling parents your kids have a disability. Um, that's a pretty uh, hard yeah. thing, uh, especially for, uh, for significant disabilities like autism or intellectual disabilities. Um, and their parents were ready to listen right away. Their parents were not. Um, so accessing that, um, I think is, is very important, uh, because, you know, uh, that might make a difference in, um, in them understanding what you're telling them, 
um, and granting you permission to evaluate this kid and um, providing services that if I just said, hey, we need to do this, they may be like, wait, that kind of, you're telling me my kid is crazy? That's actually the term they will use. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, kind of, um, I would say with every, I would say I will do that with any culture, but, you know, accessing the situation, it will be very particularly important because that will kind of tell you um, how much of a holding hand you have to do. Uh, sometimes there are clients who you never stop holding their hand. Um, and that's okay. And you have to kind of come with realizations to some of those um, parents who probably can label them. I'm like, okay, Ramses, you still have this kid in therapy and the kid is in high school. And, you know, I refer him seven years ago um, for therapy. So it, it is okay to, to know that. Don't see it as a failure um, within you. Um, see it more as, you know, so there's some people who need you more than others. And, um, okay. and that's a conversation I have often in the school because like, and going back to that case that the parent need food and insurance for the kids, the counselor told me, well, I have been sending all this information and, you know, uh, I have been holding this family's hand for very long. And I said, well, how holding their hand, stop holding their hand is working for you. And she's like, oh, it's really not working because, you know, you stop holding their hand and they went back to the same patterns of behaviors. So um, I, I don't think they, the parent is doing it intentionally. That, you know, she's just dealing with the abilities, her own limitations. So. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any control over who I am. I will say yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wanted to be a bilingual social worker. I absolutely uh -huh. did. And I tried to learn Spanish multiple times and I was like, I just forget yeah. it. It and, couldn't and happen. <laughs> I have a lot of colleagues in my practice that I've, uh, I, I run a team of 10 clinical licensed uh, clinicians. And maybe four of them speak Spanish, including myself. Um, and then the rest speak only English. And I've had this question before. How am I going to help the population? Why are you hiring me? And I don't... I don't hire people for their language skills. I hire people for their heart. Okay. That and people, <laughs> people see that. People see that. The people that you're going to work with, even the machista parent, even the machista father, even the patriarchal father will see your heart. Okay. They will see that you, you, your intentions are honest and sincere, and they will embrace you. They, they, most of them, I mean, I, I don't want to generalize your fantasy of everybody's going to be nice to you. Some parents are difficult even to me, and they don't listen to me, right? right. Yeah. And those are, I try to continue supporting, and if not, I decide, okay, can I help you or not? Can I support somebody else in the family household to support this child? But the majority of people that I work with, um, and, and even with my other therapists in the team, that's what they see. Many of them come and they tell me, oh, you know, I was so worried when you told me that you didn't have one of your bilingual therapists to work with my family, but Billy is great. He's been so nice to us. Or, or Pat is such a lovely woman. Or Nancy, wow, Nancy helped us a lot. So, so don't, don't feel that what you are is a limitation against who you are. Okay. That I really appreciate sense. that. Thank you. I, I found that true. I worked with um, chronically mentally ill adults who had a history of violence and I, I just got along, I think, so well with them. And I was helpful just because I cared. Like, and they know that no matter how sick they are. So I really appreciate you saying that. That makes me feel a lot better. You, always, you actually said something my principal always said. She is um, for a rural place in Pennsylvania for an Italian family, um, to speak no Spanish. Uh, but she always said to our team, we have worked together for 17 years, first as a teacher, the team that have been together for a long time. But she always said to our team, if we care in what we do, that's it. You know, your job will be way easier. It's just we'll know. Work hard. You. We will not make mistakes. And if we sometimes have to kind of you know, go around the system, it's okay because we care. We're doing what is right. Okay, good. Thank you. Francis, um, repeat that quote because it was so beautiful. What you are... What, what you are 
it should not define who you are. I don't know. I think it was something like that. That came out of my heart, Rick. That <laughs> <laughs> was not a quote. <laughs> We're gonna have to go back on the recording and find that one. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing. So I mean, I, I, truly, I, I truly think that that's the essence of what we are as human so. beings. And this, so I work with Latino clients, but I work with people from the Middle East. I work from people, with people from Asia. I work with people from Africa. And I don't speak their language. Yeah? And I, and, and I always come at this from the notion of who I am. I'm an I'm a almost 50-year-old um, Puerto Rican male. I have traveled the world, I have done different things, but that doesn't make me an expert in multicultural uh, diversity or anything of that nature. I have a lot to learn. I speak two languages, but that doesn't make me an expert in multiple other languages that I have to serve. But I come with an open heart. So who I am does not define, uh, what I am does not define who I am. Yes, that's, that was the quote. What I am does not define who I am. So I, Thanks, I, Christine. Now, I didn't mean to take up everybody's break, sorry, but that was a burning question I had because I was starting to feel like there's no hope for me to help anybody. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> actually was good. The, the, the good. fact that you're here today shows that heart and mm -hmm. your interest in learning. Thank um, you. And, 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 and it shows that devotion to, I want to have another set of tools in my in my bag so I can help yet another group of people. Yeah, that, that, is, that in itself communicates your devotion and desire to your field. Thanks. Um, so the Latino culture is, is collective. Uh, it doesn't focus in individualism, as I was mentioning. There's an increased rate of psychiatric disorders within the community. Community. And it comes from the notion of acculturation, but it's also impacted by previous trauma and historical trauma. Many of our young clients have fears that are being uh, promoted in their minds since childhood by their parents because of their own fears and their own traumas. Uh, when we go into the trauma section of this presentation, we will also discuss the notion of genetic trauma and the notion of um, ACEs. Everybody's familiar with the ACEs study from Kaiser Permanente? Yes. yes. Uh, so we will go in the context of ACEs for the Latino community. Um, being bicultural and bilingual actually is very important in terms of academic growth, but by the same token, the, the, the language of our children, when it focuses only in English, sometimes it causes a, a, a gap or a bridge that is very difficult for parents to cross. And there's communication barriers between parents and children and teenagers just because they, the parent is never able to learn Spanish, English and the child has lost uh, his desire, ability, or perhaps uh, has decided not to speak Spanish. Um, let me go to the next one. Well, and just think about it, even with your own teenagers and um, or, or adolescents around, if you don't have teenagers, um, they speak language a language that I don't understand sometimes myself. And I have to say, can you tell me what that means? Um, so, so just think about it in that context. Too. Who's moving there? Francisco? That was me, sorry. I was unmuting myself. Oh, okay. Um, corporal punishment is a big one that is very common in the Latino community. Um, and it's quite an interesting idea because when I sit with parents, the first thing that they tell me, uh, well, my child is having all of these behaviors and you're telling me that he's impulsive and that he has ADHD and that he's oppositional defiant and the, you're giving me all these labels. But I could fix this problem if you let me. I will pull out my belt and I will give him the belt. Or I will give him la chancleta, which is the sandal. Um, and that is the parenting style that they learn from their parents. And that is the parenting style that you will find in many Latin American cultures. And because the parents don't have all their tools, that's the parenting style that many times they will use. And we, as mandated reporters, have to report this as abuse and we see it as abuse but i'm going to pose to you the idea 
that when I have to call, I'm not going to say that I don't call. I have to call like any of us. I have, um, I, like any of us, I have to call CPS whenever there's a context of physical punishment in a discussion. Uh, the state of Virginia has uh, some specific guidelines around what is allowed in terms of physical punishment and not, um, but m other states don't have this. So I try to do this in a way that is collaborative with the parents, and I try to do it in a way when I have to call CPS, I try to communicate to the parents. Uh, I understand that this is a tool that you think you have, or it's the only tool that you might have. Let me help you learn new tools to parent. Let me help you learn new tools to handle behaviors and, and to do the punishment. We're gonna have to call together and we're gonna inform the department that you're working with me to learn these new skills. And I try to make that call as supportive as possible. So it, it, it stops being a, I'm gonna punish you for not having the tools that you should have to parent because nobody taught them to you because these are the cultural tools that you have and it becomes a process of let's acculturate to this new space. You came to this country looking a for a better life. So let me help you in that process in, in this task of learning new skills to, to provide support to your children. And even in the context of punishment, let me teach you these other skills. So now I gave the parent a greater degree of resiliency a, and I empower the parent and I also communicated to the child what you're doing is not okay your parents spanking you're hitting you with the belt it's not okay either but still what you're doing is not okay um, and we're gonna work on making sure that you don't continue to do that uh, does that make sense yeah even even within that context I, I think this is a moment or a topic where we need to be proactive and maybe adapt our informed consent in terms of being able to tell parents straight up and especially recent arrivals the this is the limitations of parenting within our context and these are my limitations and what i have to do it's not enough to just say you know if i have any concerns that the child is being harmed i have to report it we have to explain what that actually is and what that looks like so that they understand okay so if i do this that means you have to do that and that way they know ahead of time and it doesn't turn into that conversation later well i didn't know that that's not okay here that's the way i was raised that's okay in my culture so right. we want to give them the best chance that they can possibly have and part of that is being able to educate them on what is acceptable in our customs because they're not going to know because that strikes me that strikes me as is um you know the essence there because i you know i was thinking as ramphis was talking about wow what an ethical issue this is from a cultural standpoint when are we punishing them for their culture and you know so it becomes really the answer partially anyway francisco is what you said it's it's about informed consent in a way that they can understand exactly what our limitations are as it relates to that type of parenting I mean, it's definitely Thanks. something that I experienced early on when I would start doing the intakes and I would present my, my informed consent. And then in the process of the intake, they would tell me, oh, when he acts up, I just beat him with the, with the belt or with the phone charger or whatever I can get my hands on. And it's like, uh, okay, so now I got to call CPS. Um, but that was, it, in my eyes, that's my feeling because this is somebody who is coming and joining our culture and has no idea that this is the way that things are done here. Um, they would have no idea that that's the way that things are done because that's the way things have been done their entire life, their entire parents' life, and beyond that. So it, it really is up to us to be able to educate this population and let them know. I think that's a really good point and a really good idea. It, it would be no different than when I start working with a family and I tell them I'm a licensed social worker, so I have to report any suspect, suspected abuse and neglect. It's not my job to decide if it's true or not. Absolutely. Now I know I should throw in there, you know, hey, you know, and by the way, in this culture, it's not, you know, this and this is not acceptable. And I, I love that idea. 
part of what we had at the the center is we had these cards that were both in English and in Spanish that we could hand out and basically showed exactly what the guidelines were for making the report. So while that's beneficial for someone like me who's coming into the field and learning what the what all of that is, it's also beneficial to those parents so that they know, okay, so this is what gets reported. And it's, I, I think the, what may end up happening or, or the arguments that people may have against it is like, oh, so they know what not to tell you. But I, I don't think that's the perspective we need to take because that that's assuming that they are bad people that want to hurt their children. Yeah, there's a difference. There's a big difference between somebody who is abusing their children versus somebody who is using corporal punishment to, uh, rep to, to teach their kids a lesson. Mm -hmm. So we need to work then in the context of teaching them um, different skills to to help them um, with their parenting. Um, I'm gonna go share your example. And <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a context that is very important. Um, let me share a personal uh, story with you guys. Growing up in Puerto Rico with two professional parents, my father was an engineer, my mother was a businesswoman. Um, I was conditioned to when I misbehave, go look for the, the chancleta. Or the, the chancleta is like a sandal. It's a hard sandal made out of leather that you got hit with it. If I try to run away and not look for the chancleta and give it to my mom when I misbehave, then I really get the belt, right? So I knew if my mom is gonna hit me with a chancleta, it's better for me to give her that chancleta than to have to wait for my father to show up with the belt. So, Corporate punishment was completely normal as a child for me in, in my head. And in, in different educated people, uh, granted from the 1940s, because my father served in World War II, but this has not changed over time in many of our Latino communities. The reality is that we generationally, we're told, well, this is how you punish your kids. You give them the chancleta, you give them with the belt. And, and you as a child, that's what you learn, ongoing and ongoing. So it becomes a cycle. It is when you move here that you have the ability to say, okay, there's other tools. And you start learning other tools. And, and I'm not going to say that some of these other tools are not being taught in, Latin, in many places in Latin America. But the majority of the clients that we see here don't have that level of socioeconomics to have been taught alternatives. Um, Because we exist, the Latino or the Latinx community exists in this familial nucleus, in this collective nucleus, it is extremely important to get the family involved in the care of the child. And I go back to an earlier discussion where I was emphasizing the idea of natural resources to strengthen and provide greater degree of resiliency to the child. Uh, so the context that we're giving you right now is for, for that, to, to understand the family and the dynamics that happen in the family. So you not only focus on the child, you also focus on helping the family and the parents and those that are there to support the child grow and giving them new tools to help the ch your client, which will be the child. Is that me, Adonis? I think in addition with that and, and then with this Latinx view of mental illness, it's, it's important to understand that it is something that is highly stigmatized within the community. It's something that um, for unfortunate reasons, most families are going to look at or are going to assume that any sort of mental health issue is immediately associated with being crazy. Um, and as we mentioned before, that's something that gets thrown around a lot. Um, so it's one of those pitfalls that you have to be careful even with family members as great as they are as natural supports. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with clients who come in and tell me, well, my brother says that I'm crazy. That's why I'm coming to see you. And they have something, um, something like situational stress, which is causing low levels of anxiety, but they believe that they're crazy. Um, so it, it, it's one of those things that the family unit is going to be a huge source of support, but you also have to be careful that there is the potential that the client may be stigmatized by their own family. 
and then maybe pushing them away from going there and telling them you need to stop going there because it's just telling people that you're crazy. So it, it's a two-sided coin to certain degrees. Oh, oh, when, what, what I also see is that, um, you know, educating, and we go back to, to that, so educating the community, something like we have, because I have been working with the same community for quite a while, um, you start seeing the changes, although a little slow, but now um, I have uh, perhaps uh, students in the schools that I had referred the family to Ramphis, and now the family will refer other families uh, to Ramphis without me doing the intervention. Um, so, so, you know, they see the benefit of, um, you know, the benefit and the respect to um, of the approach we use when we work together. You know, we're not here to label you. We're here just to um, identify what is the difficulty you're having and how we can use your skill sets, your weaknesses and your strengths to, 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 to walk along this journey. And I think that will be very important because, you know, um, and I teach this to the kids all the time, Having a specific learning disability doesn't define you. Uh, it is part of you, it's not gonna change. Uh, perhaps if you have problems with memory, you will have problems with memory all your life. But what you can do, um, it just based on you without having focus on, you know, oh, well, I'm sorry, I cannot read that because I have a learning disability. It's just kind of trying to, to make, make these um, identifications a positive. Uh, so they can see, um, you know, it is okay to have depression. I, I share about my own anxiety many times with the parents um, because when they see, and I know that can be some controversial about sharing information, but um, something that I found throughout the years is when they know a little bit about you, um, they respect you and then they understand that it's okay for them to, to go through this. In many ways, self-disclosure uh, within the context of our communities is uh, it will never be used against you. Uh, it will definitely, I mean, I'm not saying go and overshare all of your problems in life and everything, but for you to show that I understand, I also struggle, I'm also a human being, and I'm here dedicating my time to help you is very important. Um, in that same context, when I'm, I do, I, I usually perform an intake, I develop a clinical conceptualization after an hour or two of an intake, and then I sit down with the person and I, I, I share my concerns or I share my thoughts or I share my understanding of what they just told me over the past hour or two. And a lot of times I get this notion of, oh, please, you're going to tell me that my son is crazy? Or are you going to tell me that I'm crazy? And I said, no, I'm, I'm, that's not my role here. I don't think you're crazy. I, my role here, and this is how I define mental health, not just for the Latino community, but for everybody, is the idea that, uh, that we all struggle. We all have moments of suffering. We all have moments of pain. My role is to help you navigate that. So the moments of suffering and pain will be less and less every day. And the moments of happiness and stability and growth will be greater for you. Um, so, so in that context, that's how I approach practice and how I define what I do with my, with my clients or with my patients. Um, and this is how I communicate it to them. In, um, let's see. Francisco, you want to talk about the cultural bound syndrome? So I can talk a little bit about this. Um, Ataque de nervios is a, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot within the, the Latinx community. And the reality is that there's no one-to-one -one comparison between ataque de nervios or the cluster of symptoms in ataque de nervios with anything in the DSM-5. Um, it's, this, it's this very vague idea of, and it roughly translates to an attack of the nerves, but it's this big idea of I'm going through an emotional state right now, and it varies from I have a headache to I may be seeing things. So, and that's the real difficult portion of it is kind of teasing out what does that 
that attack look like for that person. But it's something that seems to be fairly common. I know in the Central American community, but I believe it's even more widespread than that. Um, so a lot of it may look like, or at least the the diagnoses that we're more familiar with is it's going to be things like anxiety attacks, um, panic attacks, uh, generalized anxiety, depression, um, PTSD. Uh, it's going to fall within those range of diagnoses. Um, but it is so vast that it's something that you do have to tease out and to figure out what exactly it is that's going on. Um, we I can't have just... a good example. I, um, in the school one day, we were having conferences, um, uh, parent-teacher conferences, and um, somebody else was translating for this teacher, and the parent is telling her that her child was, an, an, was in a coma. And, you know, that's pretty significant for a student, right? So um, the teach, they call me into the teacher's room, and when I get there, the parents said, well, yeah, my child was in, in a coma. And I said, oh, okay, so in what hospital? You know, I started asking questions. And then I realized it was not a coma, really. She was using that term, um, but what she was trying to mean is emotionally he kind of um, – paralyzed and dissociate yeah, but you know the way she was describing it uh, everybody thought it was like something medical that he fell out of the bed they're trying to figure out all these things um but you know um the emotional coma he was it was just just a dissociation for a moment of stress so you know going again to to, to asking those questions what does that mean um it is perfectly okay so uh, in addition to attack of the nervous, we have the context of cholera. Uh -huh. When people fall into that realm, it's usually anger. And that anger causes a lot of somatization. There is a significant amount of correlation between somatic symptoms uh, and, and mental health in the Latino community. Uh, there is a, you, you will find a lot of people that I work right now in a behavioral health practice inside of an integrated care facility, which is medical. And many of our clients come to me after going to the physician and the physician finding nothing physically wrong with them, but they experiencing all of these chronic health issues. Um, mal de ojo is like a curse. It's the easiest way for me to translate it. Um, the evil eye. It, it's like the evil eye. Um, and uh, people believe in this and they associate many disorders, emotional disorders, depression, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder with the notion of, oh, it must have been this mal de ojo que le echaron. They, they, they put a curse on them. They gave them the evil eye. Um, a weakness resulting from a anxiety or a fright is called susto or miedo, or espanto, pasmo. This can be referred to when people are having anxiety, they might use this terminology. Uh, this uh, context of the wind or the cold is like um, a sense of the realization in a way, uh, and people explain it with the context of, of, of a spiritual supernatural event, like a spirit walk over you and all of a sudden you, you have this shakeness or this trembling over you. My wife is happening because she does it. She, I do it all the, time. all the time. Like um, when I walk and, you know, sometimes you're even, it's not even like, like you're walking in Target and you're from the regular section to the freezers and then you feel that cold all of a sudden. So I always said, oh, there's a spirit coming. So my husband and we always joke about that. And, and, but, you know, that's what you groan um, knowing. So I think we've covered the last two PowerPoints. I think I already talked about uh, the notion of religion is extremely important. When we get to the portion of this training that is about treatment planning, I'm going to emphasize how to use religion uh, and how to use all of these beliefs in the context of your treatment plan and how to incorporate the, 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 the religious support system that the child might have or the family might have into the into the care of your patients um and oops i went back and also i think that we talk about i briefly talk about the notion of language being a barrier uh between our youth the youth that we see that 
have gravitated to a space where they prefer to only speak English and they start disconnecting from their culture and they want to fully embrace the American culture or the Anglo-American culture. And sometimes I get a lot of fans that tell me, oh, I don't recognize my son. He behaves in ways that I don't understand. So in that process of giving extra support to the parent uh, so he can work with their child or they can work with their team, I do a lot of education, psychoeducation on, on the diversity of cultures so they will be able to see their child and understand he's not trying to reject you or he's not trying to reject your culture. He's embracing this new culture that you brought him in to live. Uh, and at the same time, I communicate with the child or with the teenager and I tell them it is very important for you to continue a connection with your native culture. And, and, and that, that way you will not disconnect from your parents and you'll be able to better understand them and communicate with them. So I do a lot of uh, family sessions when I'm working with kids and with teens and we see them, we discuss these the levels of diversity and what are the differences. And, and I open the, 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 the door for the parents and the child to communicate with a mediator that would, that would allow for, the, for that earlier notion that I was giving that there's this power differential. I try to bring that power differential to a place where it's not as important as the communication. Nice. And for that open communication to happen, that mediator serves as balancing. So, and, and I always keep telling the, the, the teenager and the child, remember, this is your dad. Do not disrespect him. Listen to him. But I always tell the father, this is your son or this is your daughter. And she's trying to communicate her thoughts and feelings to you. So please listen. So I become that mediator. Where are we at? Trauma in the Latinx community. So we, I think we have discussed a lot of the context of trauma within our community and, and the current discussion goes into the notion of mental health and how it's impacting our children. This set of PowerPoint, we're going to try to run briefly through them. I think that we have covered a lot of this already. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, this was really placed there as a placeholder for you to have extra information on the different types of trauma that are currently happening uh, within the Latino community. Francisco, you want to start with this? So, let me to take that. So this one I think is, is more generalized in terms of looking at, at all the different things that are, have been, are impacted. I think we've covered a lot of this already, but understanding that as we start diving into the different specific traumas that, that are affecting the community, th a lot of those are that driving force that are pushing people to leave the country. And then coming into a country where they are faced with more discrimination and acculturation issues, it, it's also compounding that. And without the treatment, without the that cultural connection, things can become very complex. And you will see that within second and third generation Latinos, there is a higher degree of self-harm and suicidality than on first generation Latinos. Um, it, this tends to happen and many times the parents don't understand it because in their mind they're thinking, well, I endure all of these horrible events of trauma and you are now born here in this great country and you have not experienced the things that I have experienced and why are you suffering so much? You have it sweet. So there's very little empathy from the parents many times on that, on that notion. And we have to communicate to the parents, you know, this is not a trauma competition, first of all. And two, your experiences and your child's experiences are different, but understand that your, your child is also here trying to navigate two worlds. He's trying to navigate his Latino roots, his Latino heritage, and he's trying to navigate the, the trauma events that all of the other kids in our culture here in the United States might experience on a day to day with bullying, uh, with uh, gangs, people are trying to approach them to, to join gangs, with uh, discrimination, with multiple aspects of day-to-day -day within our culture. Or um, even missing out on certain aspects that would be normal for, for a teenager in the U.S., but they may not have access to because of an undocumented standard. 
status. So not being able to work a, a, a normal job or not being able to apply to get a license to drive a car, um, not being able to apply to go to college if that's an option. So things like that can also kind of hinder the, the development of the child or the teenager that might be missing out on things that are perceived to be normal for a normal teenage development. Conduct disorder is very common uh, and impulse control disorders are very commonly diagnosed within the Latino community. I would say at a greater rate than uh, most other communities aside from the African-American community. Uh, and it has to do a lot with culture and it has to do a lot, particularly for the Latinos, uh, second generation children with the notion of the parenting style. And I go back to this notion of working in the system because uh, you, you're having a child who's been told in school, be independent, be a, an individual, and then at home is being told, you need to follow everything that your parents are telling you and you cannot uh, do anything other than what we tell you. So then that cognitive clash or that cognitive dissonance brings a lot of this, well, my parents don't respect me. I've been told in school, I was having this conversation with a kid just yesterday, my parents don't respect me. I've been told in school that I am an individual and I have rights and I have freedom, but my father and my mother always tell me what to do and they don't let me do what I want to do, right? So that then becomes oppositional defiance and it, it, it turns into this other clash with teachers and other adults in their lives because there's that cognitive dissonance or discrepancy in messaging that is happening between the two cultures. Uh, there is a high prominence of alcohol abuse in the Latino community, uh, and that is very cultural also, because whereas many of our kids uh, are prone toward uh, trying to hurt themselves now or trying to cut themselves, their parents and what they see growing up is that their parents have dealt with their trauma with alcohol. So then that's that next level learning of alcohol or substance use, uh, I would say at the higher prominence alcohol abuse and to the point of intoxication because this is what they're learning from the males in their system. Um, and that's something that permeates even music, um, film in terms of this is the way that Latinos handle traumatic events or, or stress as we drink our problems away. So it's something that is very pervasive in terms of the culture. Questions so far? So here's what I think here we uh, go. Richard has a question, but he's muted. Oh, yes. No, so when we think about, you know, the immigrant paradox and in, in, in the second and third generation having, experiencing actually more problems, if you will, um, can you give, um, and you mentioned that, you know, many of the families are coming from countries where there's a lot of gang violence. Um, can you speak to, um, you know, the second generation that, are, that start hanging with negative peers and, and are gang involved, gang affiliated, and generational gang involvement? So I, I'm sure Francis is going to want to jump in, but I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, it is... It is potentially, from what I've gathered from parents, the biggest slap that their kids can give them in their face. And it's the thing that hurts parents the most when they see their child, after all of their struggles to bring them here, then go and join a gang. And the first thing that they say to the child or the teenager is, I did all of these things to bring you here and you are you're engaging in the behavior that I was trying to escape from and that I was trying for you to avoid. But the sad reality is that within the context of gangs, how they have manifested here in the US, um, it is a niche where the teenager finds commonality with people that look like them and with people that do not discriminate against them, that don't judge them. So the, 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 the rationale for joining the gang sometimes comes to a context of almost voluntary because the gang sell themselves here as a great group of like a club, right? Oh, we'll support you, we got your back. All these people are harassing you, but we got your back now. So just join us and, and you'll have power and you'll have backup. 
Um, and I and I think that's true of any gang culture, but that is most prominent or more prominently seen within the context of of gangs with the within the Latino community. So that I see along with the kids is that there is this disconnect um, between um, the families and the kids. Um, there's not a lot of communication. It can be for uh, language barriers or or whatever. So that's something that we try to emphasize in school of the importance of that communication between the parents and the kids because they're going to seek the information they need anyway. Um, but, you know, at least in the community I work, it's a, a rich community with a lot of gangs. Um, so we know that if they don't get that information from the positive role models or their parents, they will get it somewhere else. So, you know, try to work with the, the families in the context of, um, you know, improving the parenting and going again back to the notion of um, being proactive when, uh, to try to help these, these, these families understand that, you know, that is what potentially can happen if they start hanging out with the wrong crowd. The big thing that I saw, and I think it's the, the misstep that a lot of parents make, not intentionally, but just as a fact of living here in the U.S., and it goes back to what we were talking about, wanting to come here and provide their child a better life. Parents will work two, three jobs, seven days a week, and spend no time with the child. Right. And say, I can provide you all the food you want, all the clothing you want, the latest games and all that, but they have no adult supervision. So they have no family unit here. And, and that somehow gets lost within the within living in the U.S. and needing to work to pay for, for an apartment or needing to pay for food or just wanting to, the desire to want to provide a better life for their child, they end up missing out on that key parenting aspect that the child needs. And then they look for family in any place that they can. And unfortunately, that potentially is, is a game. Right. This that Francisco mentioned is actually a, a, a very interesting reality that with this situation of COVID-19 and having to be uh, contained to your household and not being able to go to work, a lot of people are concerned about higher rates of domestic violence, higher rates of abuse. What I've seen in practice, aside from the negative context that I just mentioned, is the idea that parents are actually engaging their kids for the first time. And when I'm doing telehealth or when the kids are coming to the practice, because we're still open to see people with masks and all of that stuff, um, the kids are telling me, well, I play cards with my dad. I had never done that. Or I was in the, uh, my dad taught me to work in the car. Mm -hmm. Or my dad told me to work in the backyard and do pottery and flowering. Uh, yeah. or, or my mom was teaching me macrame or to sew. So there are dynamics that are happening that in the life of these children had never happened because the parents were working three, four, five jobs to support the household, both parents in many cases. So they were being, they, they, the kids were really being raised by themselves with their older siblings or uncles perhaps that are present that were older or a babysitter. Um, so if anything, out of COVID-19, we have seen a greater bond being established between, between parents and their kids and their teenage kids and greater points of communication. Um, so just that notion, I guess. Thanks, that was good. ACES, uh, I'm glad everybody's familiar. Because we do have context of ACEs within the Latino community. There's the notion of abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual. There's the notion of uh, neglect, physical, and emotional. There's a notion of household dysfunctions, uh, mental illness, interaction, a, a incarceration with relatives, um, uh, treatment of violence or maltreatment, a substance abuse, and divorce. So these were the measures that were explored within ACEs. Uh, but in addition to that, many of our kids, like I mentioned, at a, an early age, experienced things like seeing their sisters, uncles, parents be murdered in front of them by gangs or by guerrillas uh, or, or by, the by the government. We actually have a case that, um, that I referred to Ramfis early on too. 
um, the United Nations kids. not necessarily yeah. because the child was experiencing difficulties in school, but as a proactive measure. Um, uh, he, uh, this family, dad was a reporter in his country. And this actually is a case that had been um, presented at the United Nations. Uh, United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, family, a mom, it's a stay-at-home mom. Um, I think she owned a, a, a business back in her country. Um, the children go to a private school. They live a very nice life. Their family actually all legal within the United States. Um, the other family that live abroad. Um, that is a journalist, and he was killed by the government. Um, because they were about to to report a big uh, a big scam, I believe it was with the police, if I remember correctly. Um, this family uh, abuse of power and yes, yeah. So this family had to flee the country without even having a funeral for dad. Like mom had to pack whatever she could in a bag, leave her house, and take her two children and begin a journey. And, and, and their journey is an undocumented immigrant to the United States uh, because there was no time for her to go and apply for a visa. It was no time for her brother to go and get her. She just had to do what she had to do to survive. Um, and, you know, it goes back to, to, to being proactive. You know, we saw a child in kindergarten who was very quiet, very reserved, who didn't want to talk. Um, and as we continue exploring what happened uh, to mom, we were able to, to provide her with tools and immediately uh, get him into counseling, um, preventing from, from this to, to becoming um, more severe. But you know, you may not have a lot of kids um, in the United States that have a journalist father who have been um, killed by the murder by the government so these are these are the type of things that these kids had experienced have, have experienced and you know when we first approached mom about counseling i don't think that was one of her first ideas counseling this happened in my country all the time what are you talking about um but you know being proactive in terms of preventing um uh, her 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 two kids um from um giving them the opportunity to talking about grief with with somebody who was very important uh, for this family who now is a very successful uh, case that we had. Okay. Right. In that same context, uh, there's another event, there, there's another situation that happens when people transition. So there's a lot of people that transition from extreme poverty to come to the U.S. to have a better life. But then we have other situations like in the case of this family where the father he was a prominent radio station owner. They live very well. And all of a sudden, this woman, her whole life, she loses her husband. He gets murdered by the government. She needs to leave everything, come through walking to, from her country, past what, three, four countries in between, with, in, in the, fleeing her because the government is going to kill her in her country. She gets here to the United States. Her degree is not recognized by by the system of education or by the profession by her profession uh here in the united states and she she goes from a social economical status that was very high high relatively high uh to a very low socioeconomical status and then that puts her in a situation where she needs to start ex experiencing certain things that she had never experienced before so in their in her mind it's like what else can go wrong? Everything bad. They killed my husband. I go through this whole trauma of getting through the border and getting through all of these countries and the trauma involving that. And now I get to this country for safety and I cannot even find a job. I cannot work. I cannot do anything. And I'm going through this experience of poverty that I have never experienced. So, and we always say, well, as a professional, if something were to happen, I will do everything that's to support my family. And that might be true, and this was true for this woman. But the reality of the of the suffering that this causes to an individual, um, uh, it is it is traumatic. It is an event that affects not just the mother but the whole household. The children are also experiencing this change. How did we go from studying in a private school to now studying in a public school, 
that in a language that I don't understand, having to walk to school where perhaps first I had a person that would take me uh, to my school. So all of these changes are, are, are cause a lot of cognitive dissonance and a, a lot of um, traumatic responses. And the immigration journey itself, I, I had put myself in the shoes of these individuals um, I think to understand, you know, in my case, I, I just get in a plane and, and got here and it was pretty traumatic itself. It was in a winter and I told Rampus years after I cried um, every single day walking from, uh, from my office to the metro station because of how cold it was. You know, I'm coming from an island where it's 90 degrees every day. Year round. Um, you so, can go to the beach year round. So, so, you know, I can only imagine if that was my pain, um, the pain these people endure when they have to physically walk um, for miles and miles and miles of challenging um, uh, situations, you know, with the coyotes, with all that. In many cases, the children are doing this, this journey by themselves uh, with people they don't know. Um, so keep those things in mind. And sometimes when, even when the children get here, sometimes they even are meeting a mom and dad that they had never met because mom and dad had left the country when they were babies, left them with the grandparents. And now the kids are joining. Maybe mom had remarried, have another kid. So the, the, the families, the systems of the families are very complicated. And that's something that perhaps we don't see with other immigrants because you know, you cannot work, walk from Europe. You cannot, but that's it's something that, you know, um, uh, people from Central America can do the journey um, that way. And it's definitely uh, pretty traumatic itself, the journey. Um, in that, just, just to bring that point home, when we are talking about uh, adverse childhood rea uh, events, um, we have to contextualize all of this and understand the impact that this is going to have not only in the child, but in the family. Um, when we're talking about trauma, now we actually understand that there are functional and cortical changes that take place with trauma in the brain. And by association in the, spine, in the whole neural system, so we're connected, our whole body is connected to the brain. So there are going to be multiple changes in our chemistry and our hormonal response are completely going to be discombobulated with relationship to traumatic events. This is why we see so much somatization and so much chronic illness in many of our Latino communities. Uh, in particular, because the majority of these individuals continue a, a, after the journey, after the trauma journey, they continue to, to be on this fight or flight mode because they have come here illegally to the country, they are undocumented, and in many places they fear deportation. So the, the, the cortisol levels are always high. They're always on the lookout for what is the next bad thing that might happen. Um, and these eight people very, very ill. Um, with the context of trauma in childhood, okay, thank you, Christine, take care. Uh, with the context of trauma, we, we want to look at the, the, the development of the brain and understand how all <coughs> of the events that I'm describing might impact uh, the brain function and the brain development. So we understand that at birth, there are neural connections that are starting to evolve. And if you look at this PowerPoint here, you will see that at birth to elementary age, now you have a greater degree of neural connections happening. And then by the time you hit puberty, those neural connections uh, stand, start to dissipate. They dissipate the relationship to use. Um, and they dissipate for, for the purpose of establishing what is eventually going to be the cortex and the function of the brain for that adult. 
So if in these two episodes of development, there's significant amount of trauma happening, you will, you will find children that, as, as he said, I was um, mentioning before, might have a lower degree of neural function that might manifest in cognition and intellect uh, associated to just their executive functions and how the brain is connecting from one side to another. This, this idea that I'm giving you right now is very highly theoretical uh, but there is more and more evidence uh, manifesting to support that context. When we look at AIDS, you know, uh, just as a refresher, we need to remember that the people who were studied in AIDS uh, were significant, uh, was a significant number of people. Um, but they also we have to remember that they were Middle in the class. majority Caucasian from high socioeconomic. Middle middle class so so when you look at, at this just just add all these things that we had explained today and and see how um you know how AIDS um can be seen from the perspective of of minority groups so um it definitely you know, has challenges that we're not even close to and at the same time how how an ace questionnaire doesn't necessarily capture a lot of that either mm -hmm. definitely right Many of these experiences are, were not even fathomed by the gentlemen that developed the ACE study. Um, and, and at this point, I've had the opportunity to have some discussion with some of them, and, and, and they are fully aware of this. But ACE in itself gives you a guiding point, because when I, if I go back to PowerPoints behind, it all goes into the space of abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, and add to that war, political violence, uh, it, it, and the context of immigration in itself. I was having this discussion with a colleague of mine who's also an immigrant from another country, and he was telling me, uh, well, I'm from X country, and you're from Puerto Rico. My immigration process was traumatic, yours was not. And I said to him, my immigration process was traumatic. Your immigration process was traumatic. The resiliency skills that we both have help us uh, overcome those traumas. It's not a trauma competition. What, what we have experienced was difficult for both of us at different levels perhaps, but difficult nonetheless. Um, it is our it is resiliency that we need to focus on when we're talking about trauma. And this is what we need to teach our patients, our clients, the people that we work with, resilient to overcome those trauma. Because in his case and my case, we have been taught uh, early on many resiliency skills by our parents who were pro professionals before our immigration. For many of our clients, they don't have that advantage. Uh, and on top of that, for young clients or teenage clients that we might be seeing, their parents have added to their trauma in the process of getting here. I think it's four o'clock, four o five. I wanted to see if anybody had questions. Um, I, I, no, but I think it, it might be a good, you know, stopping point for the first part. I, I think, um, you know, the point that you guys just raised about, you know, ACEs and, and um, you know, it doesn't even come close to capturing. No. I think the experiences of, um, you know, Latino immigration and, and all that they've gone through. So, I mean, I, it, I think, like you said, it's levels, you know, it, it, it's a difficult thing to immigrate from another country, but it, and there could be levels of, um you know squared if you will uh, of trauma that's that's experienced um you know I, I we don't have to deal with um the threat of military gang uh cartel violence and threats of of just death on a daily basis and then to come here and have you know really uh a societal bias right now 
well, not a societal bias, administrative bias yeah. that um, makes you feel so unwanted. And, and there's always the threat of sending you back somewhere, right? Yeah. Yes, even even or or sending your parents back, you know that's a real fear, and um, you know not again to enter in in politics. That is something I uh, experienced working with children after election time. You know they were very worried, and that was a real worry for them. Uh, imagine to try to learn. Yeah, it, it, try, imagine trying learning in a school environment. Um, where most of the referrals come from, right, uh, for social services and interventions. And it's, um, you know, it's, it must be very difficult for a child not knowing if my uh, father is going to, if I'm going to go back home and my parents are not going to be there. Right. Um, because so, they were arrested driving down the road and deported. And that is not a reality in every state, right? But in the one that we live, sadly, uh, it is. Like we have a uh, a case in one of my schools that perhaps um, if this happened, and you know this is when we talk about um, the not having the same type of um, uh, punishment for 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 a for the situation, and is um, you know a parent who is in front of his house drinking a beer, he probably was a little intoxicated. But, you know, um, the police come and then uh, he got arrested in front of his house and the kids experienced that. But if I'm drinking in front of my house, even if I'm a little intoxicated, the police probably would not come and get me that way. You know what I mean? Right. So they have a, a level of fear for situations that perhaps are, are normal. And I think that we can just generalize not to the, now that to the African-American community who is, you know, going through their own struggles themselves. So. And it, it, not to put a finer point on the notion mm -hmm. that you just brought up, mm -hmm. uh, with what is happening right now in the country, I have seen an increased concern of many of my Latino parents and my Latino children and teenagers that have heard their parents speaking about the reasons why they came to the United States, because now they're seeing things that they had never seen in terms of these riots That's and this actually. violence and the military being involved and um, all of these events that are being now categorically presented and the media is bombarding the TV with a police officer uh, assaulting people in this protest and people rioting and burning and or the military, just the walking, military in the walking in the neighborhood. And many of them are seeing this firsthand in their communities now. And people are scared that what is happening in this country that I came for safety and is turning into my country all of a sudden. So this brings a higher degree of scare for them. And the notion of, I'm not even supposed to be here. And now this is happening here. What's going to happen to me? Uh, so so it, it, is quite a, it is quite a scary moment in the history for everybody, I think. For everybody, regardless of race, color, ethnicity, whatever we want to call our diversity. But um, I, I just wanted to bring that notion because I think it's quite relevant to the conversation, especially if you're working with Latino parents. What they're seeing on TV, many of them are worried and they're scared. And their children are worried and scared too. I think that is a beautiful place to finish today. And I thought that was just eloquently put uh, by by you guys. I just, you know, to think about our current situation nationally and how it affects um, a certain population um, in, in that unique way, I just it was really, um, you know, well put. I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I know, um, let me just do some housekeeping stuff and then, um, well, let me start with a thank you. Uh, I, I think this is one of the, the best damn trainings I have been to in years. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, this was excellent.